to order the meeting of Deschutes County Board of Commissioners on Wednesday, September 16, 2020. Um, we will start with our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I have, um, I would like to make a comment. Currently we have, per my latest count this morning, um, t at least 211 displaced Oregonians here in Deschutes County. We've had several um, facilities step up, including the Presbyterian Church, Super 8 motels in Bend and Redmond and my place in Bend. S and, um, we really need to be compassionate for these individuals. A lot of people have lost everything, and can you imagine losing everything? I know that um, we've recommended a website where you can go and make donations, or if you just want to buy them, like, um, you know, gift cards for gas, for food, um, it really, it really does help because. When you just get out of your house with just the clothes on your back and maybe your phone, it's life will never be the same. And I did follow um, Congressman Walden this morning on Twitter, uh, posted a number for those that need help to call FEMA for individual disaster assistance. And I did call that number this morning to confirm. It is 1-800-621-3362. You can also use your can you phone. Say that again? 1-800- Six two one three three six two. Thank you for asking me to repeat it because yeah. I, I say my numbers way too fast. Yeah. Um, you can um, call them, and actually, they knew when I called that I was calling from Oregon, and if I was calling, and so um, the system seems pretty well set up that you can follow through on that. If you do have access to a computer, or you can use your phone, you can go to disasterassistance.gov. So please make it easy, easy, easy on yourself. And that's where you can get um, federal FEMA assistance as an individual. So remember that um, there's a lot of people out there and I know in Deschutes County we have a lot of incredibly kind people. I just want to acknowledge um, Stewart who owns Bellatazzo this morning was delivering coffee to several of the locations. And it's not been a good year for business people but there's Stuart, he had collected water for Warm Springs for a couple of months, and now he's back, giving back and to, to Oregonians. So thank you, Stuart, for being um, so kind and compassionate and um, seriously making a, a difference and making sure that I knew exactly um, who does need help and what we can do to help them. So um, remember that. Did you I'd like to say, yeah, a couple things. So also I want to thank people and uh, particularly the people that uh, have worked so hard in the fires. We don't get too many reports about what they're doing, but there's literally thousands of people fighting the fires in Oregon. Um, and it's got to be some very tough work. It's gone on for quite a few days, and still many of them are not very well contained. Um, the other thing, I, I went out to the fairgrounds um, last week to kind of see what was going on, see what we were doing there, and then to the Super 8 hotel to kind of meet with some of the people there. A couple of thoughts I had then, I don't know if we've done anything more about it, was that one of the needs they have is, is meals for the people that are actually evacuated and staying here, and I didn't know if that might be something we could somehow use our kitchens at the fairgrounds as a place that would serve some meals. Um, something we could offer that would help. Um, the other was people have, have reached out, uh, Deschutes Brewery specifically, had contacted me about water. They have uh, is a lot of uh, canned water that they would make available. I'm not, I made a couple calls about that to Nathan and others. I don't know if that's been worked on, but I'm sure water will be a continuing need. Also, I've uh, talked with the sheriff, and uh, they also have a fund set up that people can give to, and they're um, using those dollars. Uh, they've used it for other emergencies uh, to buy gift cards for evacuees, et cetera. So I don't know the number on that. That would be something I, I thought about we could do as a county 
but they got right. I had talked to Nathan about it, but the, so the sheriff's office has gotten right on that. But we, that would be something we could do if people. I think there's going to be thousands of people wanting to do something to help. So, just I'd mention that. Maybe we can talk about it at some point. Or I think gift cards. Honestly, knowing people that have lost their home. Um, because they've lost everything, having that gift card is really, it's like cash in their hand, and they can go and buy what they need. Mm -hmm. And after a while, I, people get exhausted from having to buy everything. But like right now, they definitely would want their, the basics that they really, you know, love and prefer. So anyway, anything to brighten their day. And um, yes, Deschutes County has always been incredibly, powerfully um, compassionate. And this is time like no other when it's and it's going to go on for a, quite a while i mean this this these needs are going to they're going to change some but sometimes it seems like we're through the fires but we're not even through the fires i mean they're still burning um and i would acknowledge that uh, people don't know the status they haven't been able to see their their homes or their properties even if they've heard it's lost they they can't get a vision on it so this is very awkward uh, uh, tense time for those people that have been displaced, not even being able to view where they used to live at this point in time. So it is happening still, correctly. Right. So I believe there were 15 fires in Oregon as of yesterday. I hope no more started. But, um, yes, um, only a couple on our side of the mountain. The one uh, the Pais near Paisley, and then there was a small fire out of Ukiah, Umatilla, and Union, and it was 50 acres yesterday. It's called a birch fire, so I'm hoping that they can get that one um, stopped while it's still only 50 acres. So resources were the, hopefully um, on the ground there. And also we do have, um, we do have our rodeo, and the forecast for the air is supposed to clear, so let's hope that that continues. And um, thank you for the collaboration of our fair director, um, Jeff Hines, who's put together the Sisters Rodeo, the High Desert Stampede from Redmond, that committee, and the Crooked River Roundup. They were supposed to be celebrating their 75th year this year, and so the three rodeo committees have all come together and um, it's, it is going to be an amazing rodeo next couple days. It will count for the California um, Circuit Finals and the Columbia River Circuit Finals. Um, Cowboys in the Northwest have had, well, they've been going to, what is it, South Dakota, Montana, Colorado. It's really um, nice to think that they can be home. And if we could just get rid of the smoke, that would be so wonderful. My understanding, there's 400 or so uh, contestants, participants. Competing, so that, I mean, this is a regional uh, effect for the West Coast. Yeah, right. Yeah. And it, and the good news is, it's going to be on the Cowboy Channel, Channel 603 on Directv. On the whole um, performance, Friday night will be televised, and it's nice to know that our part of the, um, state will be recognized on the Cowboy Channel. Usually, it's Texas or Colorado or South Dakota, somewhere back there. So you know what? They're actually filming in Oregon. Friday I, night. That, uh, I was talking to one of the directors today of it, and they think that's going to be a big deal for our communities here and to get us on with a, a national platform like that because the West Coast has been so non-involved this year, whereas the Midwest and some of the South have had rodeos. So they're, that's a great thing for us as a county to have it uh, showcasing our fairgrounds and, and rodeo grounds. So it should be really good. I um, want to acknowledge um, there was a gentleman working on the arena to make it in perfect standards level. I mean, he spent hours, and I actually heard him because they wanted to put his banner up. And he said, no. He goes, we don't, we don't need to put my banner up. I just wanted to do something for Deschutes County in appreciation. And I just thought, oh, my gosh. Um, it was, it's amazing. And seeing the arena, I actually ran barrels there um, in 2015 on my horse Foxy, and the arena looks so terrific. So I know um, the whole team, the whole fair board, um, team, Jeff's team, Martin was working for hours on watering and you know doing everything they can to. They've really done a lot of um, spiffing up, and I do believe the professional cowboys are going to greatly be happy that they're here once, and then we'll get that air cleared. So, do you either of you know where to get tickets if people want to? Go to the rodeo. It's tonight or tomorrow night, Friday, Saturday. But I don't know where the tickets are available. You can go online. 
Cascade to shootout. Cascade shootout, and it's C H U T E S. Yes. Shootout. Yeah, I was, I was able to find it really easy. Just look that up, and then it says click here for tickets. Okay. So, Good. Anyway, it was nice to see it, um, Channel 21 covering it. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> And yep. and the good news is my niece is running barrels and my brother in law <laughs> is team roping and so and my nephew is still wrestling. So and he just won Greeley. So um, great to have him in town. I hope I hope I get to see that. <laughs> so um, I, any do you want to add anything else, Commissioner Debon? No, thank you. Great great notes. Okay, I want to add. Um, we did have citizen input. We had um, several phone calls that I would like to point out. Gisela Reiter called regarding our board's decision on Thornbur um, and the golf course. So we do have that message, and we do recognize it, and we will p put that information into our record. And then also Donna Harris called last night. She lives in Bend, and she called uh, with comments on the opposition to the Thornbur golf course and impacts to wildlife so and I believe she also had um, I listened to her call I believe she also mentioned the Deschutes River and how the water is currently so low so we um, we were aware of that so thank you for, both for calling one question I had about that I saw the coverage in the bulletin about it and I didn't understand this I'd like to clarify from CDD but that our decision wasn't approving the building of a golf course which is how it's been made out it was approving the site plan for a golf course if the resort ever went forward that's a different decision and it's been conveyed to people as if we, we approve the building of a golf course and I don't is that right your understanding also that we didn't do anything besides the site plan right which that's what we were approving that it met the requirements under Oregon law for a site plan it wasn't we weren't making a statement about water or well, whether we think it's a great idea yeah. or anything. When I talked to uh, concerned citizens about this, I acknowledged that there's a, um, a, a, a master plan, master planning effort, a conceptual master plan, a final master plan that has been discussed for the last 15 years. Those are the steps that have required water and wildlife plans and uh, mitigation requirements. Uh, water use is a, uh, uh, coordinated by the state of Oregon, so uh, as long as the plan fits the rules and laws as they are, uh, the water rights. We also live in a water mitigation uh, district or area, so there's no extra water to be had. You don't add new water uses, you transfer water uses. So we're not using more water. I mean, you know, relative to if somebody's using the water that summer or not, there's no more water rights available. Um, the water rights have to be transferred. Uh, so the big picture is, as I say, the final master plan is where these uh, requirements were worked out. Uh, at this point, a site review, a site plan, application, and approval is a step into really building this, but basically it's been approved in the past. And I've been involved with some of it, and some of it's still being uh, um, appealed. Yeah, that's what I understood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Devon. Okay, um, I do. We are no public input is here today. Um, we're now down to our consent agenda. Any comments? I did make one spelling correction on a name on the minutes. <laughs> that was it. Okay. Uh, so, I would, uh, since Holly is here, uh, propose pulling item number one just to hear about the uh, service uh, director designees, health services director designees. So, move consent agenda minus item number one. I'll second it. Any further discussion? Commissioner DeBond? Yes. Commissioner Henderson? Yes. And the chair votes yes. So then we'll pull item number one. Holly, so glad to see you. <laughs> so a little bit of just the kind of the scenario of when this gets implemented and then also with the list of people, I know that we have people come and go pretty regularly. So how do we either update or stabilize the list as it changes? Right. Hi, Holly Harris, a program manager at Behavioral Health. Um, yes, yeah, so, so this is um, an authority given to us by Oregon Administrative Rule that you um, authorize. And so what this ability does is when somebody's um, being seen in a mental health crisis by a master's level qualified mental health professional um, who has experience and training in this area, when they're being seen in crisis and it, the determination is becoming apparent that the individual is a danger to themselves or others, 
or unable to care for their basic needs. Um, the clinician, based on this authority, has the ability to direct law enforcement to take them into custody and transfer, transport them securely to St. Charles Medical Center for an evaluation. Um, and oftentimes these types of situations end up in what we call a two physician hold and in this process. So they're not um, used uh, unless in extreme situations, we really try very hard to offer services in the least restrictive um, environment possible. We don't like to take people against their will to the hospital. It's mm -hmm. not the best route to go, but we only do it when there's a safety concern for the individual. So this triggers kind of the deeper evaluation to physician hold is, uh, yeah, is, is very much more analysis of the situation. Correct. And so we have all of our master's level clinicians both at the stabilization center um, and our mobile crisis team have this authority since they're all doing basically the same work just in different locations. Great. So then this yeah defines the list. I see the lists are the same for the two sections. Uh, yeah, how I know people come and go over time. So yeah, how do we keep the list up to date? I have, um, you know, I've wanted over the years to just have it um, include crisis staff and more of a generic, but legal has weighed in and they really yeah. feel like it needs to specifically, based on statute, which I agree with them in their opinion, um, that it needs to outline the names of the individuals who are given the authority. So un unfortunately, I'll probably be back here a lot um, and just adding names as people um, leave the agency yep. and we have turnover. We also had a lot of new staff hired through the Stabilization Center for our night shifts based on the impacts grant. So we're adding all those people. So the list is a little bigger than, than normal. Okay. Great. Well, that puts it in perspective. So since you're here, I was, can you give us an update on the Stabilization Center um, about uh, your ramping up your time and efforts? Yeah, things are going really well. We actually um, will be open weekends starting this weekend. Um, so we'll be uh, pretty much 7 to 9 um, during the week and then 8.30 to 9 on, 8.30 a.m. to 9 p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays. And then we have, I think, made offers to all but one yet um, for our night shift positions related to impacts grant. And we will, we're aiming for mid-October to go 24-7. So assuming all the offers go well, background checks clear, all that good stuff, um, we should be good to go for mid-October. So pretty excited about that. We've been... Um, Staying busy, steady, um, and really excited to kind of have three months under our belt to kind of, we really feel like we've got a sense of how things are going and I'm ready to take it to the next step. Great. Thank you. Well, with that, I'll move board signature of order number 2020-052, appointing health services directors designees. I'll second it. Further discussion? Commissioner DeBone? Yes. Commissioner Henderson? Vote yes. And the chair votes yes. Thank, thank you, you for joining us, Holly. It's always Thanks, nice Holly. to see you in person. And thank you for <laughs> all that you're doing. Thank you so much. All right. So we will now go to item number four, action item. The proposed Sisters Urban Renewal Plan Expansion Extension. Tom, would you like to start that out? I will. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, and Corey Misley uh, should be in the waiting room. If you could let him in. And Elaine as well. Great. Um, so, uh, Commissioners, I, I should say also, we, we may have slightly misinterpreted the communication that we received originally from sisters on this proposal. Um, it, it appeared initially that it was a, an addition to their plan in terms of the um, taxes that would be diverted um, to pay for a new list of projects. But in, in uh, we've had, some, I've had some communication communication with Corey since um, I prepared the memo for you last week and it appears that it's it's uh, they're not they're operating within their original approved maximum indebtedness that was authorized as part of the adoption of the urban renewal area some time ago so Corey's going to speak to that and and uh, explain for you precisely what the proposed resolution from the city does but again it may not uh, result in net additional taxes being diverted from the four countywide service districts that exist in Sisters, um, Shoots County, Countywide Law Enforcement, 911, and Extension 4-H, but rather update the project list to be able to take advantage from the city's perspective, the urban renewal area's perspective, uh, more of the original debt that was authorized, given the fact that the, their, their expiration of the district is uh, will occur under the original proposal in the next few years so they would like to extend that deadline in order to accomplish uh, those 
existing projects. So with that, unless there are questions, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Corey. Well, I guess my question is I don't quite understand what you're saying. Are, are, are you saying basically that we aren't going to have any more tax deferral from our county taxes to the city, or are we saying that we might, but it's for other projects? No, what I'm, what I'm saying is so when the original district was authorized, there was maximum indebtedness that was established at that time and represented within that was expected or sort of an upper limit of taxes that would that could be diverted from the taxing districts that exist within the boundaries of the URA. So uh, with the, and there was a list of projects that were tied to that, that original debt. So um, that the URA has been operating, you know, uh, all these years and uh, expiration is approaching and they simply won't have time to accomplish those projects and have enough time within the, the time limit of the URA to, to pay debt on those. On, on, uh, so they're using the original money over a longer period of time is what? Essentially, yeah, that's a simpler way. So no, no new tax dollars are expected to be deferred, but the remainder of the ones that were authorized in 2003 may be still used. Essentially, this, yes. Was it going to run out in 2023? Is that was a 20 year? Originally, it looks it, look, it was, looks like it was set up in 03. Well, I think Corey can answer that. Okay. Looks like he's ready to. Teach okay. Looks like he's ready. Corey, Good welcome. Morning, commissioners. Can you hear me? I just want to, Corey. Thank you. You will almost be at Sisters two years in what November. So um, thank you very much for your service in Sisters. My pleasure. I'd like to introduce Elaine Howard, who is from Elaine Howard Consulting. She specializes in urban renewal agency consulting across the state. And I think some of you are familiar with her and her work in, in Deschutes County as well. Thank you. So I'm going to provide a brief overview. Um, Tom did give a good quick summary as it relates to what we are proposing to do. Um, the only minor adjustment to the staff report, the background information that was provided in your packet is that the changes we are proposing to make do not require um, taxing district approval. Um, we've been working with our local taxing districts and our taxing district partners to keep them aware of this update. And in the spirit of partnership, we want to obviously be transparent and you know let them know uh, what we're planning to do. Um, but the changes that we are proposing don't require uh, statutorily a, a vote by those taxing districts. So nonetheless, happy to be here, happy to be providing an update as it relates to sisters and the urban renewal agency and where we're planning to go in the future. So I'll give a brief overview. And then I think the most efficient way to move forward would be just to open it up to questions. And depending on the question, uh, either Elaine and or I are, are happy to provide additional information. So. Uh, the Sisters Urban Renewal Agency and District Boundary was established in 2003. Um, the maximum indebtedness, the amount of the above and beyond the frozen tax base in 03 that could be spent on projects within that boundary was approximately $9.9 .9 million. That was the original maximum indebtedness. Um, over the last 17 years, about $2.1 million has been spent. Um, most of that occurred uh, a decade or more ago. There's not been a lot of activity in the last five years with the Urban Renewal Agency. Um, we have done a couple of projects, including a, a streetscape design project um, a couple of years ago, but most of that, most of those funds were utilized quite a while ago. So it's sort of been in hibernation. Um, as you all know, Urban Renewal is a, a key tool or communities to be able to incentivize investment and move key projects forward. And so one of the things we needed to do was to assess the future of this district and also refresh and understand the project list from 2003, what was still relevant, what had been accomplished, um, what still made sense, and then also what needed to, to be added um, in, in terms of uh, moving forward. So we, we did recognize and see that you know, we, we have quite a bit of maximum indebtedness that we still have at our disposal. Um, 2023 was the expiration date at that point um, in 03, they'd put in a 20 year term. 
which again is not a requirement of urban renewal agencies. I was I was not around. I've not seen uh, background information or any of the um, uh, kind of intentions as to necessarily why they chose a 20 year time frame. I think it does make sense to utilize these funds uh, as expediently as possible, uh, put it put it to work and and ultimately get the dollars back on the tax rolls once the urban renewal agency has accomplished their their goals and objectives um, and and get that tax base back to all the taxing districts, including the city itself. We forego uh, the largest amount of funds into into the URA from our general fund. So um, looking at moving forward, uh, we did want to use <coughs> some of the remaining <coughs> and we felt like about a, a seven year extension. So moving from the 2023 expiration to a 2030 expiration um, would provide us with a adequate amount of additional capacity for key projects and sisters. So extending the duration to 2030 would allow us to have an additional $4.7 million in capacity for projects. And at the same time, that would leave about $3 million of maximum indebtedness not used. So it certainly is a, a compromise as it relates to the amount of original maximum indebtedness. Um, and then we also have layered into this resolution that an extension beyond 2030, if the urban renewal agency would like to do that, would require, in, you know, again, not a statutory requirement, but putting this in our update, a little bit of a, a handcuff, so to speak, that we would need approval from three out of the four top taxing districts to extend the duration beyond 2030. So kind of saying that this is, this is we, we did want to put an expiration date, you know, we've been working closely with our local taxing districts, our fire district in particular, um, and, and want to be reasonable um, and thoughtful with how we want and when we want to use these funds. So uh, at that time, you know, later in this decade, if we wanted to extend that, it would require the city, um, the school district, the fire district, and at this point, the county, three out of those four would need to extend beyond that 2030 duration. So we felt like that was certainly a compromise and in line with how expediently we plan to utilize these dollars. Um, the other important adjustment is the project list. And several of the projects from 03 are, are no longer relevant. Um, one of the key ones to note is that at that point, um, sisters and ODOT were exploring options as it relates to perhaps a couplet in downtown. Well, that's no longer the plan. That's not in our transportation system plan. We've made a significant investment with the roundabout on the west end of town at the US 20 Barclay intersection. Um, we are full steam ahead doing everything we can, um, investing local dollars in the design of the, uh, the other bookend, the roundabout at the Locust 20 intersection. Um, and that's in our transportation system plan, and, and we're working closely with, with ODOT and other partners. So, you know, we needed to update the project list as it relates to the relevance of different projects in the community. And one of the key things we did uh, over the last year that we've been, been working on this, it's been a, a little bit of one step forward, two steps back. Um, we had a staff member, key staff member leave who was working on this. Uh, we got momentum back going again over the winter. And then as, as everyone knows, in, in March, we had a bit of a curveball <laughs> thrown our way with COVID. So this got, again, kind of put on the back burner, but uh, here we are um, wanting to move forward with this at this point. Um, but I, I wanna emphasize that the project list really includes projects that have already been vetted through community plans, whether that is the Sisters Community Vision, Sisters Country Vision, or whether that's through um, existing transportation system plan or water sewer master plans, um, or you know top priorities that we know uh, everyone in the community uh, there is a need for, uh, such as such as workforce housing. So uh, we did not do a, a, a long, um, broad public engagement process to update this project list. We really wanted to be targeted and identify key projects that we know are already on the to-do list and understand how we could expedite those projects and really get them across the finish line utilizing urban renewal agency dollars. So um, that was that was important and that was a bit of a, a strategic decision. So I think I've hit the, the high notes as it relates to uh, the duration extension and the project list update. Um, ultimately, some of the compromises that we feel like we've made we feel like it's very reasonable. Uh, we feel like we're going to be able to use these dollars, uh, put them to work sooner rather than later, get some really important stuff done, um, and, and go on from there. So just we're not ex expanding 
the maximum indebtedness. We're not expanding the boundary. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned at the beginning, and uh, that's why you know, we're just here, kind of briefing you all, making sure you're aware of this and comfortable, um, but don't need to necessarily seek formal approval. So uh, Elaine and I are here, happy to answer any questions you may have, and open it up. Thank you so much, Corey. This Thank is you. Commissioner DeBone, uh, and this might be for Elaine. So when we have a um, urban renewal district that's been in place for, what, 17 years, I guess now, uh, and it hasn't been utilized the way it was envisioned, so that means that the, the tax rate, the dollars to be taken out of the other districts, has been less than could have happened. And now this is going to kind of re-engage the district, and then the, the, the taxes will... I guess my thought is the, the tax assessed value has gone up X and has it been utilized less than the value or is it the maximum amount coming out of the districts as first 17 years go by? So the district has been taking its full division of taxes over this time frame. Um, the actual amount of money that they've been taking is less than was projected in 2003. Okay. And that's one of the reasons why they haven't been able to do more within the district is the growth that was projected originally. You know, we, unfortunately, many plans that were adopted in this time frame have this problem because of the Great Recession yep. that impacted property values and the ability of urban renewal areas across the state to do projects. So they have been taking division of taxes but the amount that they've taken is far less than what they projected in their original plan. Is there a balance in a bank account at this point in time? As in, is there a positive balance on the, or is there debt associated with the, the district? So we, we have a, or every year we're required by state law, just like the county and the city and other public entities to uh, adopt a budget and, and follow Oregon budget law. And so, yeah, we do, we do have uh, cash, cash on hand. Okay. Uh, we have a reserve account, and then we also do have debt that we are servicing from some of those projects earlier um, in the life of the URA. Okay, so there's kind of both. I just thought, yeah, maybe there was no debt associated with it. So there is debt and there's cash in the bank. Correct. Do we have that information? Is that published in our documents? I didn't... I didn't... We could send you the, the budget... Uh, for the, the urban yeah. rental agency budget. And it's just for information, just interesting to see how it looks over a 17 year period. Sure. So, uh, Corey, this is yeah. Commissioner Anderson. Um, so, just to clarify, actually, the biggest contributor outside the school district to these funds is Deschutes County because we come in under uh, four categories Deschutes County, Countywide Law Enforcement, County Extension 4 H, and 911 are all things that we oversee. So that, that actually totals more than the city of Sisters by a few, by 20, 20 some thousand. So anyway, just, just an FYI. Um, you know, we've kind of been getting a crash course on urban renewal districts because we had proposals from the city of Bend. We have one coming from the city of Sisters that we're also working on now. Uh, and then we, this one here, um, it, when I look at the intended targets for this, I mean, I, it's great if there's going to be a workforce housing project. I don't know. It looks like this only contributes 400000 to that four hundred or $4 million project, so 10%. So, it, I mean, that may or may not come to pass if there's not somebody that's going to spend the other $3.6 million to do it. Is that... Is my thinking correct there that you still need to find the funding? Because I'm not sure the city of Sisters is going to build housing units, but maybe maybe they are. But well, that that project in particular, that's a good example of uh, this plan and this project list being a little bit of part art and part science. So you know, we came up with that four million dollar estimate. You know, looking at and talking with uh, Housing Works. And other regional housing providers in terms of what uh, a larger scale multifamily complex that is the best bang for the buck in terms of providing units would cost and then we we do not have um, all of those dollars secured um, i think if you talk to uh, david brandt or, or others who are in that business it is a a complicated recipe 
um, with many, many funding sources to be able to ultimately get to pulling the trigger on a project like that. But um, having uh, additional local dollars is always a bonus and certainly can move a project forward faster um, or, or even move it forward at all if, it, if perhaps. Well, yeah, and, and so if that's what you're talking about as a housing works type pros, um, prospect, that is. We don't know who the partner would be. We, we, you know, but, we would, but if it's something like that, if it's some, so my concern with those is, and I, I just want to get this out there, is that they build very nice facilities that cost three and four hundred, you know, dollars a square foot, whereas what we need are things that are being built for a hundred to two hundred dollars a square foot. And I'm just, if if this urban renewal money is going to those expensive projects, I just, I don't know. I think that's something you as a city should look at whether that's the best bang for the buck with the taxpayers' money because it's it's very. They build very nice things, um, and they get a lot of different incentives and state funding and all this stuff. But it's we don't house as many people when we that way as we could. Is all I'm saying. So, okay. Noted. Um, Corey, delighted to see our roundabout is on the the list. Who, um, since I'm the chair of the COAC group for Central Oregon, I'm just wondering: Do we have a, a time frame when that roundabout? is going to actually happen? Has ODOT told it? I know you guys had already spent the money on the design. That's That was excellent. You're doing your share. Yeah, I mean, we, we have a, a, a timeline that we would love to see happen. Unfortunately, it's it's far from, from rock solid. So uh, a couple of years ago, the message we were getting from ODOT is that you know, we weren't gonna see funding until uh, the you know 2027 or beyond, Jeez. they're just not, they're not seeing dollars in these uh, next uh, couple of years. I've been pushing it. It's been going on all my surveys, you know that, so. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, that they need to um, get more money spent in Central Oregon because we are the number one growth region and definitely helping sisters with um, east to west and west to east transportation through the city would be really lovely. Yeah, I'd, I'd reiterate that. You know, I I don't get their schedules. I mean, we we got all these other projects we're working on from ODOT, but I I see that roundabout as one of the ones that makes the most sense of any. And it doesn't. I mean, we see how many are being built in the city of Bend right now. It just doesn't make sense that seven years from now we'll have a roundabout there when we could have it next year. So I don't know. I Commissioner Dare, if we can help somehow with the state and pushing them. Right. I don't know where Commissioner DeBone is. I, I'm really adamant about it. I, I think it's more important than the one some of the others that are talking about are spending so much effort. Well, it on. does back up the traffic. Oh yeah, it's awful. In Sisters, I mean, it does. You do slow down. You have to. You, you're in a def, nether, um yeah, no, part I of. Totally but agree. we need to. If we probably should write a letter together, don't you think, to ODOT? Great. And I, I do believe I did do the survey, and I, it was part of what I thought. That, well, I don't know. know what the survey is. I'm talking about it was, lobbying. Well, it was. A, I don't need to ask anybody's opinion of this. I, I see it, and it's this should be pushed. Is and I'm glad you're pushing it. I don't. But I, we could push we it could bigger. It, we could push it more. Yeah, and I, yes. I let's just push think it. the most obvious yes. roundabout places I see in the county more yep. than some well, of the others. And we could ask ODOT to join us at a meeting like this or a yeah. work session type meeting and just discuss it. My understanding is because I've worked with. Uh, uh, Gary Farnsworth on this, and we see him, uh, him and Tom, uh, Bob Townsend at the MPO. The House Bill 2017, a couple of years ago, pre-scheduled the projects for the next 10 years, and that's the, the box they're in. They really don't have a lot of uh, authority to change the project priorities for 10 years because of the, how, the way House Bill 2017 was written. And I'm just saying, so it's at a legislative level is more than an ODOT level, and that's what I, you know, I've been informed of. So, well, we'll yeah, just let you know, that's what I understand. Yep. Okay, then we'll talk to Representative Bonham and Senator Finley, yeah. and uh, they're actually going to be in town in a couple days, so we will ask them to put that on the top, and I know that they definitely would be willing to do that, so um, that would be great. Whatever we can. Corey, we're not hearing you. I can see your lips are moving, but the sound, is he on mute? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I won't talk. 
Can you hear me? Sorry. Barely. Okay. I, Speak up. Okay. Uh, yes. You need to speak a little louder. Real quick. We, we would welcome your, your help in, in any way on that project. Um, you know, whether that's looking at the county TSP, um, whether that's being, you know, writing a letter of support for a grant, so maybe to the, the, the feds, um, or whether that is working with local legislate legislators, um, like Commissioner DeBone said, you know, at, at a legislative level um, at the East Salem. So um, we're putting our money where our mouth is. We're going to do everything we can, but yeah, it's going to it's going to take a team effort. So thank you for the support. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a a failed overpass in Southern Deschutes County that's not on any project list at this point in time. It's on a All monitoring right. list. It's, it's what? It's on a monitoring list. You know, mm -hmm. and, and maybe they'll do some engineering work, but there's no money scheduled for it. So as I say, it's a great discussion to have. We can yeah. definitely put some pressure on it. That's a great point. Okay. Good. Any other questions for Corey? No, thank you for the update. Or Elaine? So as I understand, we're not being asked our opinion of this. You're kind of informing us. We could, we, we ventured our opinion for the city of Bend on their urban renewal district because it's a big, a big ask tax wise. And unfortunately I'm running for office and it's been used now against me that I wasn't supportive of the community, but um, so I'm not very inclined to vote on anything doesn't make if it's not needed people wonder why we, we why we ventured into that the city of Bend it's like they don't even know that we're deferring tax dollars so huge tax dollars yeah. so in fact yeah so uh, if Elaine's available real quick again uh, do you work in the state of Oregon primarily or other states I only work in the state of Oregon and my firm only does urban renewal consulting. Uh, and I've worked with uh, the majority of urban renewal agencies across the state, so. Is there any legislative discussion right. about ever changing this system? <clears throat> and I'm, you know, this is your consulting world, but my point is, uh, uh, you know, we're receiving these and it just, it's kind of sour sometimes about how the dollars, it's, they're not voted on by the citizens. The city council has the opportunity to do this. Uh, so is there legislative history on making changes to this, or is that a big no-no, or is, there, is, it a, is it a partisan divide, or can you just give me some insight into that? Um, yes. The, as far as I know, there is no partisan divide on urban renewal. It's pretty widely supported across the state because it's a tool in your community's toolboxes to improve your cities. And again, I'm a proponent of urban renewal. I do urban renewal consulting. On the other hand, I have um, in the 2019 session and in the 2009 um, session worked with cities across the state uh, and the special districts to make changes to the urban renewal statutes to address some of the concerns of the different special districts. So 2019, there were some changes made to reflect some of the concerns. Um, yeah. So yes, there are ongoing issues addressed um, at, at this point. Because of measures 5, 47, and 50, we had to change how urban renewal division of taxes was done. Mm -hmm. And that, um, that, that is what we have now. So nobody has come clear back to say, well, should we change again how urban renewal is actually funded? Nobody's done that. But what we do do is have ongoing discussions about how to address issues of the different special districts. Yep, great. Well, let's just say, I mean, it just, uh, you know, the city of Bend's downtown uh, uh, core, core plan was a big one, you know, and, and uh, you know, we wrote a letter of opposition, but it really didn't have any, uh, any weight in that situation. Uh, we asked them to make it a little bit shorter in time and a little bit uh, less uh, scope, and it was, Acknowledged, but it was moved on. So, yeah, just they, vibrant just discussions about the it. Money was taken. Basically, yeah, without really any involvement of any of the industry. And when they're that big, and we have multiple ones, you know, so we have this this shadow tax base that's being swept before you know the the voters really understand what's going on. But as I say, I'm just sharing with well, you what we get to see as commissioners. The other thing that was interesting in that because it was I was asked about it in an interview. Only two entities gave an opinion on that. The school district didn't, the COCC didn't, the library didn't. And the school districts don't because 
The money is taken out of the property taxes that would go to the school system, but isn't taken from this school district. So it's, it was $70 million or something that goes into the big general fund for the schools in Oregon, but the local district doesn't see it as a loss to their district of that much. It's only a loss of like five. But meanwhile, the education system is being drained of these monies that go to urban development as opposed to education generally. But so they don't they don't say anything. COCC didn't say anything. Well, and then the education uh, that, budget at the legislative session is always a contentious, you know, item. Yeah. It needs a lot more. They want, they want more money, money but yeah. they're they're allowing money to be taken at these so, ground ground at so, the ground uh, level. Corey, this is nothing about sisters at this point. I'm very supportive and, and I'm excited about the plans. It's just the, the bigger picture is we don't have a say. You know, thank you very much for informing us, but as commissioners representing all the citizens in Deschutes County, we almost don't have a say in this, which is awkward. Thank you for joining us yep. today. Um, thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Corey. Um, almost congratulations for two years of being in sisters. So appreciate that you're there. And Elaine, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you. All right, okay. So I believe now we should go to Nahad for our COVID update, please. So this would be a Facebook Live uh, item also, I, is my understanding, so just... Uh, yes, the rest of the, that meeting will be Facebook Live for the wildfire update, also from Nathan. Okay. Good morning. There he is. Good morning. Good morning, Nahad. Good to see you. We can't quite hear you. You cannot hear me? Well, now we can. It was, it was converting. Do we have this okay. document or? No, I don't think so. Mm. We don't uh, have this one. I think I may have sent it too late. I think it was around 9.30ish and maybe the team didn't have a chance to print, so my apologies. You know, up until last minute that we're, pre uh, I'm, uh, basically that I'm presenting, uh, we are updating the data that we are getting. Uh, so that's why it's a bit, um, we cannot send it earlier, but I'll do my best to send uh, the slides earlier. Well, they might bring it down to us. So that would be appreciated. Okay. I'm All right. writing right now. So I hope you had a nice break from us and from me last week. Oh, you were missed. You were always <laughs> missed. Where'd you get it? Thank you, I was fishing for that. I appreciate that. Well, I know, but there's three of us. So if I, can I get started or would you Please like to? Please do. Uh, okay, wonderful, thank you. So I, I hope we're streaming live because I do have a community quiz coming up. Uh, but uh, let me start off by thanking you again for inviting us. For the record, my name is Nahat Sadrazadi. I'm the Director of Public Health for the Shute County Health Services. Uh, unfortunately, today I don't have Dr. Fawcett um, with me. Uh, he had uh, some personal matters to attend to. Um, I do believe that Dr. Conway is on is available on Zoom. Uh, many thanks to Jenny Faith for the great, um, the usual great data analysis and preparations she did for this presentation. And as, uh, as always, I would like to express my gratitude to the health services staff for their dedication, compassion, and meticulous work. So we, a couple of weeks ago, as you are kindly aware, we launched a community quiz. Um, just a reminder to our uh, community members who might be watching the live stream on Facebook, please do insert the answer to this uh, question in the comment box. Um, and I believe that the first community members with the correct answer will receive a beautiful fanny pack which can be used for carrying masks and hand sanitizers. Tom. So this week's question is a Thank true you. and false one, and it's timely as schools are reopening, at least uh, with comprehensive distance learning programs. For K through 12 to reopen in-person classes, only two of the following three metrics must be met. So less than 10 cases per 100,000 population, less than 5% county test positivity, and less than 5% uh, state test positivity in the preceding seven days for three weeks in a row. So it's a true and false question, and I'll come back to this uh, question at the end of the slides again. A quick shout out uh, to Whitney, Morgan, and Jenny who um, helped prepare um, the webpage on our um, uh, theshoot.org website. If uh, community members go to um, 
deshoot.org slash COVID-19, they will see a visualization of the uh, data. So great job to the, uh, the three colleagues and other uh, colleagues who were involved, perhaps our IT team and others. So congratulations. So commissioners, this slide shows the county case by week. Of course, this week is not shown yet. We've had five new cases so far this week. So far we've had, uh, since March 11th, we've had a total of 728 cases with 12 deaths. Uh, we saw a huge spike in July, but a significant drop in August. This past week, we did see a slight increase of around 54% in new cases reported. I think that number is somehow skewed because in one day we had around nine cases reported. So I think that that one day number is the uh, best skew the uh, total numbers for the week. Having said that, I think uh, all of you and all of us can appreciate that variability in numbers uh, going up and down is expected. We can't ex you know, just expect the numbers always to go down or to remain stagnant, right? So there's gonna be variation. Uh, importantly, though, what we've seen is a drop in cases in August, and I'm personally convinced that the drop in numbers is driven by two factors. One is, of course, I've said uh, over and over the choices and the behaviors of our community members, of all of us, especially in use of masks. And two, I believe, is the county's um, uh, containment strategy, which uh, is contributing to containment of the numbers and even the drop in numbers. This next slide is the cumulative Before number. you go on there, uh, Hod, I wanted to ask you something. So to me, this, this slide that you just did highlights the whole problem with the intersection between public health and education. Is it, so we're in three of the last, or in the last three weeks, two of the weeks we're not below the 10 per 100,000 that we need to be in the county to be in public, to allow the um, four to twelve to open. Yes, we were. We were. Uh, no, we're not. It's you have to be less than ten per hundred thousand, and we're at twenty, so we're more than ten per hundred no, thousand. That's, that's for two hundred thousand people, though. The chart we're right at ten. That line. Um, we're no, that's my point. We're right at the line. We're not below it. It, it is well. Maybe you can explain. Does it have to be less than ten per hundred thousand, or or right ten. at ten? This is my point, is it not? Yeah, uh, Commissioner, I think if we are uh, coming with around 20 cases uh, per week or less, we can make a strong argument for reopening of schools. I don't think we're going to be um, held from reopening schools uh, at this juncture. So, uh, so you're saying that this there's a hard rule, but we can argue that at 20 we're okay, even though we're a little bit above 10 per 100,000, because we don't have quite 200,000 people, I don't think, in the county. So we're a little yeah. bit of... Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, technically speaking, uh, uh, the, the three metrics that we're looking at um, are, uh, one of them does say less than 10, and it's not less than or equal to. So you're right, technically speaking. That, right. That's my first point. The other point, though, is it could easily be 21 instead of 20, and then we're above. And maybe if we didn't test so many, you know, we're testing, you know, huge numbers of people now. So it just seems to me it's so fickle that, or if we just go up to 21 and 22 in two weeks in a row, it just seems like this whole test based on an exact number doesn't really work with education, and I guess, I guess that's what I'm seeing here. I don't think anybody started a campaign to reopen the schools because of it. But you see it like as a 54% increase from one week to the other. I see it as kind of noise. I mean, it could easily go from 13 to 20 or 20 to 13 that just by whoever gets tested. I mean, it's, we're only doing a, you know, it's not an absolute test. So if we didn't do as much testing, Commissioner, probably where it would show up is the positivity rate would go up. No, I, I get that, yeah, I get that. But if that goes up, if our case numbers are low but our positivity goes above 5%, then it's, uh, it's basically we're in the same boat. But we have to meet then, both tests. Uh, just, again, I'm just saying this is a very, yeah. It's, by locking it into numbers, uh, it shows the fickleness of it. Now you're giving away the answer. 
Now you're giving away the community quiz answer, Commissioner. <laughs> well, I, yeah, well, I think it's what we need to talk about, so. Yeah, for sure, you're right. So we need to meet all three metrics in order to um, open schools for K through 12. So it's at the county level, it's at the state level, and it's the, it's the case numbers, Commissioner. You're, you're absolutely right. And in fact, if numbers do go up, uh, or down, and the testing is varied, it could definitely show up either in the positivity or in the hospitalization. That, they're going to show up in the hospitalization admissions anyway. So may I proceed, Commissioner? Actually, I wanted to comment that if we didn't have the 66 positive cases in the long-term care facility, we wouldn't even have that middle spike. Right. So you take out those 66, and yeah, it, it's... And you, it's a, that's a, in a very small community in Deschutes County. So anyway, the positivity has been below 5% since uh, the 26th of July. Our positivity has been extremely, extremely um, in the positive end of life. But it's like how many people are in the hospital? That, that, I can't wait to get to that one. Where's your positive? Where'd you it's, the positivity tests? Uh, it's back there about Further. 15, 14, I don't know, 10 pages or oh, something? We'll get to it then. Okay. Yeah, we'll get to it. I just, yeah. you know, if that's one of the things that count, I think that's something that we really need to be thankful for. And there were still, what, 1,200 case, um, tests, 1,240 tests this week, last yeah. week? So sorry. Okay, Nahad, go ahead. Sure. No, it's your point if we do remove the... Uh, long-term care facility um, outbreaks, uh, we will have around maybe 20, 30% reduction in the case numbers that we would have seen, or maybe more in the, uh, uh, we would still probably see somewhat of a increase in, um, in number of cases. It wouldn't take everything away, but it definitely would take some of it away. Um, so you're right on that point. Uh, so if I may continue on this slide, this is the, uh, this is the cumulative numbers. And uh, of course, as the numbers go down, the curvature here becomes more flat. And the flatter, the better, of course. Uh, we do see an increase in rate of change, of course, in July, but it's um, slowing down quite a bit. And here I'm also um, inserting some of the key milestones and decisions and holidays. And it's interesting to just follow this pattern and see what transpires or what could transpire uh, usually around two to six weeks after uh, some of the key milestones or holidays, for example. Well, maybe. <clears throat> this slide, Commissioner, uh, I think Henderson, you were alluding to this. Um, on, in terms of the, this is one of the school metric uh, metrics, which is the weekly case rate per 100,000. And we are around, um, um, hovering around 10, 7, 10. So the last three weeks, uh, we've, uh, we're definitely uh, showing um, a great improvement and sign of uh, moving in the right direction. And in fact, in the last five weeks, I would say, uh, five, six weeks, we are uh, definitely seeing a decline in numbers. And that's, again, thanks to um, the behaviors and choices, as well as the containment strategy. This slide shows the county cases by age group, and the key message here is that really um, everyone is vulnerable. We are even seeing cases um, in less than um, uh, 20. Um, however, around 50% of the cases are between the ages of 20 and 50 years, and that's the box in red here, as you can kind of see. This slide, and I'm going to say in advance that the 0% uh, that you see in hospitalized is not um, any issues with the data, is correct figure. This slide shows our cases by age and month. So our age distribution of um, cases has looked fairly consistent the last few months. Uh, as, uh, as you can see, there's probably an equal uh, in September, and even in August, we're, we are seeing an equal distribution of the case by um, demographics and age groups. Uh, in September, of the 30 plus cases we've had so far, none of them um, uh, seem to have been hospitalized. And that's uh, something very positive and something for us to explore further to understand um, better what's driving that. This slide shows how the cases are linked or categorized. 
we have continued uh, to have less than 30% of our cases as sporadic, or uh, we call them um, community acquired or unknown linkages. So this is really critical. The less that percentage is or that proportion is, the better for the, our containment of this virus. Um, and, and because we know the source of infection, we're able to really um, employ our containment strategy. And uh, just a reminder to our community members is that uh, uh, when we do know the source and we are able to reach out to the contacts, we can reach out and uh, not only provide them with early support, which is probably helping with um, the severity of the disease, but also we're able to encourage them to quarantine and stay out of contact with others so that they don't infect um, um, other loved ones, family members, neighbors, friends, colleagues, and, and community members. So really communities cooperation is critical in the success of this strategy. Uh, if somebody receives a phone call, um, it's, it's good to verify who's calling them and then uh, please be forth, uh, 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 forthright in terms of sharing information. And I have a um, little story that I will share a bit later about this. I included this slide um, because I think uh, we're seeing an interesting uh, trend here. Uh, this is the history. This slide shows the history of travel among cases. Um, overall, around 200, so specifically 192 people indicated recent travel. That's around uh, a quarter of the cases. Um, early in the pandemic, you may recall, we had many cases who had uh, traveled. Now, the reason I included this slide is because in September, in September, we have seen nearly half of our cases report recent travel. So I would say that traveling and the attributes of traveling, such as reduced um, spaces, higher duration, and numbers, uh, should be factored into our decision making um, in our daily decisions or uh, when some holidays are coming up and the choices we're making, we should consider those. So you're saying travel, including car and plane? Yes, Commissioner, yes. Okay. But yeah. I think, so in that period where you're saying 47% is there's been travel, we only have 33 cases that we've reported in those two weeks that are in September. So probably we'll need a little bigger pool, won't we, to really see if that's a, I mean, that's a pretty small number of cases so far. It's not like some of the other weeks where we've had, or months where we've had 200 cases or something. Yeah, you're right, Commissioner. We, uh, we definitely will keep monitoring um, the data in September and see what transpires. This is uh, preliminary data for your, um, um, for your and communities um, uh, viewing at this point. You'll Do you have any further breakdown of the travel? Is it people that happen to be coming here and getting tested positive, or are they people from here that go away and then come back? Or Yes, these are Deschutes residents, Commissioner. Oh, Deschutes residents. So by traveling, you're saying they're... Yeah, within the state, outside of the state, with car, with uh, airplane, yes. Hmm. So if I, if I can perhaps bring, uh, share a quick story that might bring the data to life. Um, this, uh, the story might seem a little bit awkward only because we're trying to mask, obviously, any identification potential here. Uh, so bear with us, um, uh, please. Um, but I think the essence of the story will, um, is powerful. So a group of friends uh, celebrated a special occasion. Half of the friends traveled to another state for a few days, and unbeknownst to them, several became infected with COVID-19 while away. When they returned without symptoms yet, they spent a couple of days with friends and family, and then the other half of the group traveled to another state shortly thereafter. While the second group was away, they learned that several from the first uh, trip, uh, from the first group, had tested positive for COVID-19. A few days later, several from the second group also became ill with COVID-19 while still away. So in all, this outbreak lasted almost two months, affected 10 households with a total of 21 confirmed cases and 71 close contacts, all of whom were actively monitored for symptoms for 14 days. So this is just a story around socialization, but especially traveling outside of um, our residents and uh, 
being at risk of uh, expo exposure to COVID-19. But Nahad, did any of these people end up in the hospital? I mean, because do we do this for the flu? I mean, this, this type of a detail? I'm just wondering, did, do you know, did any of these people end up in the hospital? Commissioner, let me check on that and get back to you. It was a fair, yeah, let me not uh, uh, speculate on that. Um, I can check on that and get back to you. Is that okay? That would be great. Thank you. Oh, good question. <clears throat> now, a, a centerpiece of our containment strategy is testing, as you are very well aware. And in general, we have sufficient slow tests, so-called slow tests, um, these are the send-out tests uh, in our community, but we're still limited in terms of rapid tests, as you're kindly aware. In this slide, tests are shown by collection dates. Uh, we have remained consistent with testing roughly around uh, or above 1,500 per week, which is two, two and a half times uh, or 250 percent higher than the target of 600, which uh, we had put in place. Uh, the last two weeks, commissioners, uh, as you, you may notice from the shadow, as with previous weeks, uh, these are not complete data. We're still, we, when we receive the test results, then we go back in, enter the data, and so on and so forth. So the numbers will uh, most likely increase uh, uh, in the next co a couple of weeks and get updated as well. But uh, we are hovering around 1,500 with some variation there. Um, so given that uh, it's not... I mean, really what we're seeing is that in the last six weeks or so, uh, testing has pretty much remained um, consistent. It's not like uh, we're having a surge in doing tests in the community where it's affecting identification of the cases in the community also. Now, this is the second metric which the school systems uh, uh, look at uh, closely, and all of us look at, even as parents, I look at very closely, uh, quick, uh, um, uh, frequently <laughs> to make sure uh, that we're making uh, positive um, uh, progress here. Uh, we are seeing a very good uh, low positivity rate in our uh, county. Uh, even uh, two weeks ago, though the numbers are not complete yet, it was below 1%, which is exceptional. And so many congrats to our community for the choices that they're making. And just well, the, you know, the other thing, though, too, and this is where it gets into all this stuff, is as we've talked about, I've asked each meeting, like, well, how many of these are people coming in for procedures? You wouldn't, ex you know, as we increase the number of people getting tested for procedures or, or whatever, then you would think the positivity would go down because if, it's, we're not testing people we think are sick. We're testing people to make sure they're not sick. And so you would think the positivities would be going down like this, whereas earlier in the pandemic, the people who were getting tested were really sick. And so that's why they were getting tested. So it'd be interesting to break this out where, I mean, not that it'd be good news for us necessarily, but it would be interesting to see if of what's the positivity rate of the people that were actually sick? That'd be interesting. Yeah. The, okay. You're, you're, I think you're, you're spot on in terms of your observation from earlier on in the pandemic where we had limited tests. So really um, there were strict guidelines on who was being tested. And of course, the positivity was going to be higher. I mean, in some places, it was up to 50% positivity rate, I recall. Um, whereas now, we are in a much better situation where we're not only testing um, the uh, sort of those with clinical symptoms, but also uh, um, some of the asymptomatic cases, as well as uh, perhaps pre-op uh, ca cases or routine testing that's being done in some of the long-term care facilities. So, so you're right, that does affect the positivity rate, uh, Commissioner. But our positivity, it was never that high, Nahad. If you look back on one of the charts, it's a small little line when it was 203 tests, 185. It's, you can't hardly tell the line. So I don't believe our positivity was ever, did you say 50%? Not, not in our community, Commissioner. Well, I, was saying I know, but we're, we're talking about uh, dishes right now, so I'm going yeah, like, nah. Yeah. 
Um, I, you know, I know the state positivity, the cumulative is 4.6 today. The state uh, positivity for last week was 5.6. It jumped up a bit. But even the state positivity has been following. So, because yeah. it has to get under five in order for our schools to open. Five from the state. Right, state for the whole state. Five, yeah. So, yes, yeah, so the, and that's on a weekly basis, not on a cumulative basis. I learned that lesson yesterday. Hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're right, you're right. Our numbers w never went that high, thank God. Um, and the rate was never that high, you're right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, this slide is, uh, I'm sharing this slide, which is the percent of cases first identified through contact tracing, which is, again, another key piece of our containment strategy, which is contact tracing, which helps with identifying new cases and containing spread of um, this virus. So around a third of all of our cases in Deschutes County have been categorized by the team as having first been identified as a case through contact tracing. So that's really a, an impressive um, effort in, in ensuring that we're containing this uh, virus. We jump on a case very quickly within 24 hours. We try to identify as many uh, exposed individuals as possible and we get in touch with them. We provide support, uh, wraparound services, and importantly, we encourage them to uh, um, uh, contain or, or uh, quarantine themselves so that they don't potentially infect uh, others. And that's a really key piece of um, the strategy in um, uh, containing this virus. And uh, well, again, the other- Congratulations, that's, here. you know, congratulations to the people that are doing the contract tracing. I, I brag about them all the time to other people, about right. how good they are. Right. And yeah. so you're welcome to brag about them right now too. That's yep. wonderful. And yeah, <laughs> that's a third Go ahead and brag right now. Yeah, that's good. No, I'm, I think it's something to really be yeah. proud of that they're doing. And thankful for that they're doing such a hard hard work well and it's a skill that uh, got matured pretty quick I'm sure there's data systems behind it the phone calls just the demeanor on the phone uh, you know the, the dedication to uh, you know listening to uh, what's going on so yeah congratulations and thank you very much for the contact tracing crew and I have a story to share right now about what could go wrong when, when we don't have good cooperation uh, necessarily from the community. So I have to say, the vast majority of people in our community cooperate, and I thank them for that. And, and, uh, and really, um, people feel a sense of responsibility, and it's their duty to, they feel that to, uh, um, uh, to, their, to, them, to themselves, to their families, to their community for cooperating. So thank you. Commission, and before telling the story, though, Commissioner Henderson, this 60% here is really the cases who have been identified through clinical evaluation and routine surveillance and other methods uh, beyond you know what I just mentioned in terms of contact tracing. Okay, great. So here's yeah. the so here's the story really of not only to demonstrate the importance of containment and contact tracing, but what basically could go wrong if we don't get adequate or sufficient cooperation. Uh, it's a bit long, but I'll go through it quickly. Basically, our communicable disease team began investi investigation of a positive COVID-19 case who was not very forthcoming with information about those he had been in co close contact. Um, this is while he was contagious. <clears throat> he also denied working um, while he was sick. So the original case was later identified as a source of exposure for at least one of his coworkers who tested positive the following week. The coworker ended up passing it to another staff member at work the three co-workers ended up infecting at least 10 other people in their households and exposed dozens more. It is very likely that if the original case had either not gone to work when he was starting to feel sick, or if he had been willing to assist the investigation, that everyone associated could have been kept safe from exposure and infection. So due to the cooperation of the co-workers, and kudos to them, and the willingness of the employer to work with the Shute County case investigators, further control measures were instituted in order to prevent greater spread of COVID. So this is really a story of both those who are um, uh, really willing to um, participate and cooperate and have a sense of ownership in, uh, and have bought into the response, and those who are choosing differently and, and, and what could happen or transpire as a result. A quick um, slide on the hospitalization um, admissions. Um, 
as of this as of yesterday, we have four cases admitted. As of this morning, I believe we have five uh, with the latest data that I've seen. And just a reminder that this is a regional indicator. This is uh, St. Charles Health System for the region, not just the shoot. And the uh, admissions here are not just the shoot uh, residents. But this is still a relevant slide because this is a regional indicator anyway. So it doesn't really matter if the beds are taken by non deshoot residents or not. If the capacity uh, reaches its threshold, then uh, it's, uh, it's bad news for everyone, whether they live in deshoot or not. So this is- So are any are of those for... cases deshoots County then? Do you know that? Yeah, we have a couple, Commissioner. A couple, like, are you referring to two? Yes, Commissioner. Yes. Are they ICU? I believe one might be commissioner. Yeah. On a ventilator? That's my understanding, commissioner. Okay. Yeah, I can double check on that for you and get back to you. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, commissioner. So actually I'm, I'm uh, wrapping up uh, uh, with a couple of uh, messaging slides. This is basically your slides. I leave it for you to kindly, uh, again, inform the community about the importance of school immunization and catching up. So you're welcome to chime in at this point or I can continue. Continue. Sure, the, I, I mean, it's that time of year. It's good for the community, for all of us to be reminded that uh, we should ch check in with our uh, providers, with our pediatricians, make sure we look at the uh, vaccination cards and ensure that our children and ourselves are up to date with our vaccines. This is a really important uh, public health um, strategy and method in, um, in uh, reducing vaccine preventable diseases. And just to remind the community again that life without vaccines is basically what we are facing today um, for the last six months or so. So if we didn't have vaccines for measles or for um, uh, pneumococcus or for pertussis, uh, or a uh, commissioner, you've always talked about polio. This is the kind of stress that we would be going through pretty much every day if we didn't have those vaccines. So let's make sure that we're not complicating our lives um, and um, <clears throat> by facing vaccine preventable diseases uh, this fall and beyond. And uh, related to that, the flu vaccines are available. Uh, I believe um, um, one of our, one of the main providers for children is also now has um, flu vaccines uh, uh, available in their clinics and my kiddos are scheduled now to go and get them um, this week i believe in fact uh, um, tomorrow or friday all people um, over six months are eligible of course there are some caveats and let's make sure that we're not having um, covid patients and um, um, uh, flu affected patients uh, competing for the limited resources that we have uh, in terms of our um, um, uh, hospital beds and uh, admissions and what have you this fall. So in wrap up, um, the key message is uh, no matter what, no matter the crisis or circumstance, we cannot compromise our values in our community, in our county. We need to continue to uh, be kind and keep up with the great work that all of us are uh, doing. We really need to keep focusing and helping our kiddos get back to school. This is a photo of my kiddos uh, having their distance uh, learning for, uh, for half an hour uh, behind the computer. It just, I mean, on the one hand, I was um, happy to see there was something going on. On the other hand, it just broke my heart. They need to go back and uh, um, attend in-person classes, socialize and have that experience, uh, in-classroom experience. They're only gonna be in first grade once in their lifetime, but at least I'm hoping. So, Nahad, I got a question about that based on our previous conversation about, well, we're at 20 cases a week, two of the last three weeks, and you're saying, well, we could make a strong case. Is there, a, is there somebody making it because our positivity is so low? Is there somebody in our communities now making that case that we should be able to open on a certain date for you know, kids past uh, third grade? I mean, it, it looks like we're meeting the test for the the younger ones, but is there, I, I mean, I've never heard about how, what's the mechanism or who's the advocate to, would say we could make a great case. Is that you or the school district or? Actually, Representative Hell wrote a letter 
that was printed in the Ben Bulletin, um, clearly pointing out the inequities and what's going to happen with the, the kids that don't have access to the pod. Well, so we could, if she did it, she's a right. state legislator, but right. she's not. So she's as a candidate, you know, she's she, so we could do it. You're saying that right. we could advocate for it, but there's no official person that's in charge of advocating for Ben Lapine schools to open or do you know? Well, I did I mean, hear that we they can, were considering it. I know that originally only 63% of the teachers felt comfortable in yeah, going back in the classroom. Too. But then when uh, speaking to someone whose children go to St. Francis, they said, just think of the workers in the markets, you know, the worker in Safeway that worked for months there. And, um, you know, they were exposed, perhaps. And, no, I, yeah, and, and I get And, that. and it's like about, teachers can, you know. Yeah, so, but what I'm saying, you're saying there's teachers are over here. We've got an elected official here. Is there somebody that, he said, well, that we could make a strong case because we're at 20, mm -hmm. which is really close to 10 over the last three weeks. Is there somebody lined up to make that case officially for the, the school district or is the, does anybody, and I don't know, I'm just asking, is the school board deciding it or is, or how are they, who says no, I see that there's a case to be made, but who, and I, we could make it, but, but, I've been but we're it. just, but we're lobbyists. We're not, we're not in charge of schools. And the, so we could lobby for whatever we want, but my point is, is the school system is there somebody there that Nahad knows about or maybe one of you know about that's doing this? I was on the um, Zoom call yesterday with Curtis Scholl from Sister School. We were talking about this opening up the schools and how the numbers have been so low. And yet, because last week, the weekly state positivity was over 5%. Um, you know, High Desert ESD was a bit concerned that, okay, if they go, you know, if they go back in, what if the numbers uh, trend higher? But uh, I make the case when I have my weekly calls with Leah Horner from the governor's office, and when I have a call with the governor, I say, really, we need our kids back. They need to have in the classroom learning. Oh, did your kids get to go to kindergarten, Nahad? Are they, they now in? Did. They did, Commissioner, but overseas. Um, okay. Yeah. All right, so, so I, this would be in the classroom in Oregon then. We, we want them in that classroom. So that yeah Thursday. I, I, yeah, I'm I'm happy to um, just briefly respond to this, um, Commissioner um, Henderson. Um, so first of all, um, in terms of the strategic guidance and direction that the school systems are getting, uh, pretty much ODE in collaboration, close collaboration with uh, OHA and Governor's Office. Um, they're working together, but OED, ODE is the one that's uh, uh, providing um, direction to um, the school systems. And at the operational level, Commissioner, our team, we have two or three staff who are spending daily, uh, they're spending time on a daily basis working with the school systems, reviewing plans, uh, guidelines, providing guidance and assistance. So we are very much involved at the operational level and helping uh, basically uh, uh, make the wheels turn. I did receive an email from the school system yesterday which uh, demonstrates that the numbers that they're seeing and the trend that they're seeing is affecting their decisions. Uh, the email indicated that they'll be opening schools uh, for in-person classes in a hybrid format um, uh, earlier than initially expected. So certainly they're looking at the numbers closely. They're getting uh, guidance, uh, strategic and operational from all relevant parties. And I'm, I'm convinced that they're trying to do their best um, to make um, uh, the right decision that works for pretty much everyone involved, families, children, teachers, administrators. Um, but it's tough. It's really a tough uh, position to be in. Well, I'm just so excited you're saying that uh, just they're to gonna open up earlier. To clarify what you're saying, you think that the Oregon Department of Education and maybe through some consulting with the Oregon Health Authority and with local health departments like ours is working with individual school districts to approve, approve their reopening plans? Is that kind of a summary of what you think is going on? or? Well, they're providing uh, guidelines to, um, to the schools. 
where um, and ex there are expectations around the development of plans for opening, not just for reopening, but of course it would include uh, the testing and any outbreaks that they might have and what have you. Those plans come to the local health authorities where staff review them. Uh, we don't have a role in approving those plans, but certainly we have a role in providing guidance, uh, technical input into those plans. And from there then it's taken to up the chain of command for approval and so on and so forth. So yes, is this, uh, you know, we're, we're familiar as commissioners with the reopening plans that we worked on for the state about reopening the economy. Is that kind of what these look like, that each school district has a reopening plan that multi-page or however I think that's page? a really, I think that's a fair analogy, uh, Commissioner. That's a really good analogy that you just made. Yes, it's analogous to the work that you had to undertake and the difficult decisions you had to make. Uh, uh, given the numbers and the capacity and so on and so forth, and coming up with a plan and the metrics and putting in the resources. Yes, that's, that's a very fair analogy. And do you think that it's the Oregon Department of, of Education that ultimately says, yes, Ben Lapine School District can reopen on such and such a date? Well, I, I, I can't speak to the intricacies of their decision-making, ODE and the school system, uh, specifically, Commissioner. I just know that there is a, a strong consultation or consultative process. Um, and, uh, and I do think some schools have a level of uh, freedom depending on the circumstances in their local uh, situation or local context. But I can't really speak to uh, more details in that uh, in terms of um, um, how the decisions are made specifically between ODE and the school systems. Well, the, one of the issues, Nahad, is the fact that the Oregon child is in school one year less than the rest of the country because we have the shortest school year. And I just see our Oregonians following further behind. I know I saw that um, friends of mine had their triplets going to high school in Maine. They were getting on a bus and going to high school. Um, I know that St. Francis here is open. I know that a religious school in Baker County opened up a couple weeks ago. They had just under, it was K through 12, under 100 students, but they were able to open up. And I just feel like, um, you know, our public schools, gosh, we, I mean, really, you look at your children and you know, they need to get in the classroom too. You just, you you don't, you want to um, limit the amount of screen time kids have in front of the computer. And by doing all this Zoom training, um, you know, it's totally against what's really best. Not all kids can learn that way. And it really does help to have teachers. That's why teachers are some of the most inspiring people that you'll meet in your lifetime. You'll remember what they say, you know, forever. So Absolutely. anyway, I think whatever we can do to get our schools open would be so appreciated. Now, I share those sentiments, uh, commissioners. I really do share those sentiments, both not, not really in my capacity as necessarily public health director, but really as a parent of right. twins, six years old, who are experiencing first grade for the first time. And this is not how it should be experienced. So it's a tough situation to be in. Fortunately, the numbers are down or going down. We're making the right choices. And now we're putting ourselves in a position to have some in-person classes. So that's what I'm grateful for right now. And it's, it's really a cause and effect, right? It's not just randomly happening. It's because of the decisions we're all making collectively. Um, just to wrap up maybe the uh, messages, because I know I've taken too much of your time, but I'm grateful for that, so really. Um, traveling uh, it seems to um, have contributed um, uh, to uh, some of the spread of COVID-19, at least in September. We know it did earlier on in the pandemic too, but as Commissioner of course, Henderson said, let us uh, see more data to make uh, uh, stronger conclusions. But nevertheless, Ness, if anyone is traveling, they should consider the risks associated and mitigate those risks so, uh, so that they can protect themselves and their loved ones. And of course, back to school immunization and flu, uh, please put those, um, uh, have those, uh, please do consider uh, immunization and flu vaccines uh, so that we don't have a complicated fall more than it's already complicated. Right. So um, we're going to get through this uh, because we're Deshoot United, caring and smart. And just to wrap up with a quiz, um, I don't know if, uh, if Whitney's there and if, if any committee members have uh, 
uh, responded to this, but um, I can give the answer or you can give the answer. Anyone interested? So it's a trick question, right? It's talking about only two, but really it's all three metrics which have to be met. So that's, um, that's the question. So the answer in this case would be false. So thank you, Commissioner, okay. again, for your thank time. Thank you so much, Nahad. Really appreciate it. Okay, we really need to immediately pull up Nathan. I believe he's got another something on his schedule. I'm so sorry, Nathan, um, for the wildfire update. Is he, is he still available? Yeah, yeah I'm here. Thank good, you, Nathan. Good morning, good Commissioner. Morning. Sorry we ran uh, over a bit. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I still have a little bit of time. I've got to get down to uh, another place here in Eugene, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you an update. I believe uh, Ed Keith and Dr. Conway also have some information, but if you yes. like, I'd be happy to start. Please and do I start. apologize. I'm going to leave my video off because I'm operating on my cell phone. So uh, it seems to work a little better if I do that. Um, well, good morning. I think uh, the, the plan today was for me to just talk a little bit about a highlight of about what Deschutes County is doing to support other counties uh, throughout the state of Oregon. And I just kind of launch, I think Ed will have a little bit more information on specific fires, but I would say that multiple counties were affected by, um, by a, a number of large fires uh, big, uh, that uh, ravaged uh, multiple parts of the state beginning really on, or at least the significant fire growth occurred starting on Labor Day and through the night. And uh, those counties that affected significantly were Jackson, Douglas, Lane, Lynn, Marion, Clackamas, and Lincoln counties. And uh, we, uh, we've been supporting uh, several of those counties, either virtually or in person with resources, uh, time, and assistance. Uh, I'll give a, just a high level uh, overview and then answer questions. So uh, really our assistance started um, in significantly about two o'clock in the morning on Tuesday, last Tuesday, I think it was September 8th, uh, 8th um, and uh, uh, received a call um, from the Oregon State Fire Marshal's office indicating that there was significant fires uh, growth on uh, the Beachy Creek fire in Marion and Lynn counties that was uh, impacting the San Am Canyon as well as uh, a fire in the Mackenzie River Valley uh, near uh, Blue or uh, between Mackenzie Bridge and Blue River in the Rainbow area, and that a number of citizens were, uh, or community members were potentially cut off and that were evacuating possibly east. Uh, so we, um, working with the fairgrounds, was able to uh, open the fairgrounds uh, within probably about an hour, get the fairgrounds lights turned on, gates open, and, and bathrooms open, and, and be able to receive um, uh, folks to. Um, that, that had evacuated and provide them a, a, at least a safe place to be until we could uh, get assistance from Red Cross to support them. And uh, that that actually went rather smoothly considering the circumstances and really a, a big shout out to Farron Expo for all the support that they've done. Since then, uh, Farron Expo has continued to host that temporary evacuation point, uh, which has been a, a receiving area for evacuees to check in with the Red Cross uh, and get shelter support uh, as well as um, information. Uh, the the uh, Fair and Expo has also been supporting some campers that uh, evacuated with RVs and were able to uh, utilize the, um, the RV park as well as some, I think, even just camped in the parking lot temporarily. Um, I believe all of the evacuees in Deschutes County are currently uh, in hotel rooms and uh, tremendous response statewide from American Red Cross. And they've been um, really doing yeoman's work on getting um, evacuees or, or people that uh, have been displaced because of the fires into uh, hotel rooms and taking care of their uh, basic needs and food and, and, and health needs. And we've had opportunities to speak with a number of, of uh, members of different counties and they've all been just very pleased with not only the Red Cross's support and how they've been treated, but also of our community support. And so I think that is a true testament to uh, our community members and their desire to serve and help others. Uh, we do have, at one point, I believe we had, I know we had uh, 
members of Douglas, Lane, Lynn, Marion, and Clackamas and Lincoln counties uh, in our county taking uh, refuge. Uh, so in addition to the, that, uh, Sheriff's Office has been supporting uh, uh, about three counties specifically, and that's uh, Lane with uh, myself as well as Haley Rich uh, from our office that's focusing on recovery is over on the ground here in Lane County currently. We also have, uh, have a number of our command staff as well as patrol deputies supporting Lane County, uh, just in coordination, administrative support, uh, emergency operations center support, uh, as well as uh, patrolling the east end of Lane County uh, because of the um, impacts to the traffic and communications infrastructure, which has uh, made it a challenge. We also sent, uh, for three days, we sent deputies to Jackson County to support uh, extra patrols in communities evacuated by fire. <laughs> uh, we've also provided logistical support uh, with um, uh, transporting fuel and other critical items uh, to Eastern Lane County to uh, keep uh, basic critical uh, first responder operations functional. Um, Road Department uh, uh, also responded initially. Oh, and I also have to apologize. We also had our search and rescue team over on Tuesday the 8th to support evacuations at campgrounds as well as uh, the community parts of the community of uh, Mackenzie Bridge and the Blue River area. Um, our road department uh, came over and, and assisted us significantly on Tuesday with route clearing. A number of evacuation routes were um, blocked by down trees and power lines and power and, and telephone and power poles. And uh, certainly in the event of a additional evacuation, we wanted to ensure that those routes were cleared. And, and then the road department has also continued to assist uh, our program, the emergency management program here at the sheriff's office with some logistical support uh, since uh, our staff has been uh, either virtually or physically redeployed to assist Lane County. They've been assisting us with moving PPE and, and other items uh, to the fairgrounds and, and around as needed. Uh, a health, uh, health services has also been a significant player in supporting uh, us. Uh, I, and I'll let Dr. Conway, if he wants to go into detail, but I do know that uh, they have been, uh, they have an agreement in place to assist with uh, the contact tracing in Lane County as needed. Uh, they've also been a significant partner with us, assisting uh, in cases where evacuees uh, needed uh, language support or uh, uh, culturally appropriate messaging and translation services. Uh, and then also behavioral health has been a, a uh, a great asset and resource to assist us with folks uh, that certainly are, are um, challenged by these circumstances. Uh, also, the uh, the position that uh, the board uh, approved to assist uh, public health and the Sheriff's Office Emergency Management Program with uh, tra contact or uh, testing and PPE has taken on a on a, a, a greater role in PPE coordination since uh, we we're stretched a little thin, and so that's thankful. Our chaplains have also been great uh, to assist um, uh, folks evacuated by the fire and to assist us. Um, and 911 has been uh, on standby to support numerous public safety answering points throughout the county uh, with with uh, um, dispatcher call taking services. And, and uh, but I don't believe that they have um, been specifically called on to respond as of yet. I just want to kind of um, give a little context. All of these fires, um, significant uh, infrastructure damage impacting roads, communications, utilities, as well as a number of the, the responders and uh, critical um, or uh, people that have, uh, you know, really response or critical uh, response or recovery roles have been personally affected. And, and so I think that has also contributed to the need for other counties to support uh, these counties in need. And uh, really, to be honest with you, I'm just very thankful for our uh, our elected leadership and our um, and the leadership here at Deschutes County to um, allow us the opportunity to serve our neighbors. And so, thank you for that. Um, and I'll be happy to take any questions. I, I just don't want to run over on what Ed and Dr. Conway have to say. I have a question. What? I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, Nathan, thanks for your report today and all the work you're doing over in Lane County. That's great to hear. Um, can you give us any ideas of things that beyond just county staff people helping, 
that the you know the residents and citizens of Deschutes County may be able to do going forward. I mean, this is peers were just getting started with the, kind of the emerge. I mean, maybe it's well, it's still an emergency in some ways, but the long-term costs and injuries and damage and stuff. And what could we be doing, or th should we be thinking about going forward as a county? of 200,000 people that want to help as well. That, that's a, a great point, Commissioner, and, and thanks for asking. I, I, think, uh, I think our initial kind of uh, um, guttural reaction or, or uh, initial reaction is always just to want to throw, uh, jump in and help, and, and there's been a number of, of grassroots as well as community-based organizations that have done just that. I think as moving forward, some of the critical needs are going to be um, uh, really financial support uh, for these communities and and you know um, I believe all the counties significantly affected by these fires did receive what's called an individual assistance declaration by uh, by President Trump through FEMA which will open up some pathways to financial and other assistance but that will not even begin to meet likely will not begin to meet the financial burden placed on um, community members in these affected counties. So there are a number of organizations that are standing up uh, resources and, and I'll make sure that we get that information to Whitney and maybe advertise that on our face or on our social media and our website to, to direct people to uh, the recovery funds. And then also I just want to point out that uh, the Red Cross uh, had made significant investments uh, financially to house um, uh, displaced persons and to feed them and and that's been um, truly remarkable so you know obviously financial donations the Red Cross certainly um, the Red Cross what the Red Cross does for our communities uh, constantly whether it's a house fire responding to open shelters in times of wildfire or other natural disasters is is certainly they're a critical partner to us and we certainly appreciate them and I, I think moving forward there will be a lot of information available each county will probably have a slightly different recovery framework and how they move forward in recovery. And, and I think as those uh, become made aware of, I, I think we can utilize our position as, as leaders in the community and, and a, as a, a place where our community members go to for information to, um, to really uh, uh, spread that message and, and to be able to connect people to the right place to assist, to help. And then also, uh, there's, oper there's chances that uh, people will maybe permanently relocate to, uh, to our county and, and may need a, a continued assistance as, uh, as this moves forward. I think, uh, to your point, I, this will be months and years of recovery for these communities and, and uh, wanting to make sure that we recognize it's a marathon and not a sprint. So thank you for that comment and question. Um, Nathan, I actually started the meeting out this morning with the 800 number for FEMA for the individual disaster assistance. And let me repeat that number again in case someone just picked up our Facebook live stream. It's 1-800-621-3362, or you can go to their website, which is disasterassistance.gov. And I did call the number, and it did seem pretty easy to work through it. They knew I was calling from Oregon, and immediately, um, yes, I was being channeled to where I needed to go. So. Um, that, you know, thank you for mentioning that again. I know it's probably not, it is definitely, it's a marathon, or maybe it's a 100-mile race, honestly. <laughs> to No, really, to get through all this, to, you know, to, you know, recoup, re, you know, rebuild, whatever you need to do. It's, it's going to be an enormous undertaking for so many people. So yeah, one thanks, question. Thank you, Commissioner. One question, Nathan. Uh, so... Uh, just what are the bullet points of the current status, as in are any of the fires uh, starting to be contained or are there structures being lost currently? Uh, and then, uh, yeah, just evaluation of damage too, just kind of the high points. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have a great, I think Ed will have a, a better. Yeah, okay, maybe Ed, here, okay, yeah, I would yeah, say yeah. That, yeah, I think Ed will, Ed will have know, that. Given okay. a current situation on those fires, yep. Okay. I can speak mostly to the holiday farm fire because that's what I've been involved in mostly. Yeah, it's, it's all active right now, I know. I know, it's just incredible the amount of land that these fires have consumed in our beautiful state. So 
Um, you know. Yeah, I just a little bit of context. I heard at a, a cooperators meeting today on the Holiday Farm Fire, the incident commander, uh, uh, Link Smith from the Oregon Department of Forestry, one of the team, uh, <clears throat> it described that there's, uh, I, and I'm not going to say, over 250 miles of fire edge on the um, on the holiday farm fire, and I think there's a little bit more of that, but I want to make sure I'm not <laughs> overstating it. Uh, and so, really, if you think of something along the lines of trying to build fire line from Medford to Portland, and so I think that's uh, uh, really put put that into context. And that's yep. one fire uh, on the landscape here in Oregon right now. Yeah. Well, the good news is your wife had her birthday in well, it's in an August, so um, you know it's. It's like, will we see you again? I hope, you know, I hope they can take, you know, we can get a little rain and actually uh, make a huge difference over there. Do you know, do you have rain in the forecast at all, Nathan, in Eugene? Uh, the, uh, in Eugene, there is some uh, rain in the forecast. I've got the uh, forecast here. I think starting uh, potentially tomorrow and Friday, they're looking at uh, kind of a more of a, a, a a precipitation component in the weather, uh, but there is also a chance of thunderstorms. So, you know, the, there's some challenges with precipitation. A little bit of precipitation without thunderstorms is good. Too much precipitation or thunderstorms can also pose some challenges. So we're kind of sitting here with our fingers crossed, hoping we get the right uh, equation of precipitation and, and higher humidities, which will certainly help the firefighters. Great. Thank you so much for joining us, Nathan. Um, any more questions for Nathan? So, Ed, do you, do you want to let us know where we're at then with the fires? Be safe, Nathan. All right. Thank you. I will. Thank you. All right, commissioners, uh, good morning. Still got a few minutes left in the morning. Uh, Ed Keith, uh, Deschutes County Forester here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen if that's all right. Um, and give you a quick rundown of some of the more significant uh, fires on the uh, on the current uh, incident map. Um, and I'm going to uh, give you a rundown of the, the fire, the location, the acres, the percent contained, and uh, some of the estimated losses uh, to date. Uh, and I'll run through those at a kind of a high level fairly quickly. Um, just want to give you an overall all, um, look at these fires and, and what I would say for those that are, are watching uh, the meeting live or on Facebook, um, that uh, if you're interested in looking at these in any more detail, uh, this, this website that I have pulled up, centraloregonfire.org is a really good place to go. Uh, we, there's a, a, a running news feed of all those fire updates as they come out that are all posted in one central location as well as uh, both this incident map that I have up and the air quality map uh, all on one website. And people are finding this website. We've had uh, close to 600,000 views on that in the last 30 days. So it's uh, it's a good place to go for information. So with that, I'm just going to dive in uh, to this map specifically and just take a real quick trip around the state uh, high-level overview of each of these incidents. It's going to start with the Echo Mountain Fire. Uh, this one's near Lincoln City. Uh, it's currently 2,500 acres, 40% contained, and estimated 100 structures lost uh, on that one. Uh, then I'll move over to the Riverside Fire. Uh, Riverside is uh, near Estacada. Um, it's about 136,000 acres, uh, reported as three... 3% contained this morning, 53 structures lost on the Riverside Fire. Um, for the uh, Beachy Creek Fire uh, that is uh, basically runs between Detroit and, uh, and Lyons in the San Am Canyon uh, and north, uh, Beachy Creek is listed at 191,000 acres, 20% contained and unfortunately 1,288 structures uh, currently reported as, as destroyed uh, on that uh, fire. Do you know what the uh, house breakdown is, Ed? You said 1,288? Uh, that's just total, it's reported out as total structures. I'd, okay. I would guess that a fair amount of those are not houses, but uh, a, a, a lot of them are going to be houses. 
Okay. Um, well, we don't have that level of detail at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Uh, the Lion's Head Fire, uh, which stretches basically from the, the Warm Springs uh, Reservation to the east all the way down to Detroit, uh, is 184,000 acres, uh, reported as 10% contained uh, this morning, and uh, has 280 structures lost, including several of those that are in Detroit. Uh, going south uh, to the fire that Nathan was mentioning, the Holiday Farm Fire, which is in the McKenzie River drainage. Um, it's uh, currently about 167,000 acres, 8% contained with 424 structures lost. Um, unfortunately, this is a fairly long list, but I'm going to keep th these going here. So the Archie Creek Fire in the North Umpqua drainage uh, near the community of Glide is 125,000 acres. 20% contained with 112 structures lost. Ed, you don't have the fatalities per fire, do you? Um, I've just got a total fatalities confirmed okay. as of uh, the end of the day yesterday was 10. Uh, there were two new fatalities uh, identified yesterday, but there were also two that were pre previously identified as fatalities that were then identified as actual animals that were lost. Uh, so I believe we're still sitting at 10 uh, unless there's been recent news in the last couple hours. Uh, there are an additional 22 people confirmed missing. Um, and so I do expect that to continue to go up. Uh, okay, so continuing south, uh, the South Oban Chain Fire that's between Eagle Point and Shady Cove here. Uh, south Oban Chain is uh, approximately 32,000 acres. 20% contained with 80 structures lost. Um, the Alameda Drive fire, uh, which burned from Ashland to Medford and really impacted the communities of Phoenix and Talent, uh, is now, uh, or was uh, reported at uh, right around 2,800 acres, I believe. Uh, it is, uh, good. the good news on that one is it was reported yesterday as 100% contained, so that one is, uh, is uh, the, the firefight on that is essentially over and, and they'll be going to more recovery. There was unfortunately 600 structures lost in that fire. Um, the Slater fire that started in California by Happy Camp did burn into Oregon. Uh, it's listed as 137,000 acres, including about 30,000 acres in Oregon. It's 10% contained. Uh, there are 150 structures reported as lost on that fire. I believe most, if not all of those are in California. Uh, moving over to the east side of the state, uh, we have the 242 fire, which is uh, near the community of Chiloquin. 242 is uh, 15,000 acres, 21% contained with 36 structures lost. Uh, and then finally, I will move over to uh, the Paisley area where the Bertain fire is still very actively burning, uh, listed at just shy of 40,000 acres, 17% contained with one structure lost. Um, so uh, by all totals, uh, if we looked at any one of those fires individually, that would be probably a record breaking fire for the state in terms of structures lost, uh, not to mention the 10 fatalities that we already mentioned uh, that totals just under 900,000 acres in just the fires that I listed. Uh, there's, there's a few other smaller fires that are on the map as well. Um, so you know very if the Birch significant. Creek fire, if they put it out, the one that's in Umatella Union County on the line, it's up I, in Ukiah? I didn't find any information on that, Commissioner. Uh, most fires that are under 100 acres don't make the situation report, so I wasn't okay. able to track that down. Unfortunately. I'll just, I just know it was 50 acres, but I was, you it's know, good. I was just afraid that if it explodes, mm -hmm. if they don't get it out at 50. Ed, what was the number of structures in the Riverside fire? Uh, Riverside, uh, 53 structures have been listed as lost. And, and what about the Lincoln uh, Echo, Echo, whatever Echo it's Mountain. called? That was 100 structures. 100 structures. So that adds up to just shy of 3,000 structures. I, by my math, I added 2,974 structures. 
Um, to my knowledge, the, the most significant fire before this event was the Canyon Creek fire where uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 42 homes were lost on that. So if that puts it in, it puts it in pretty stark uh, perspective, the, the amount of loss that we've experienced in just, just shy of a week in Oregon uh, due to these fires. You know, one, uh, I don't know if anybody's been down to the Almeda fire from here. I know we've been over to some of the other fires or county people have, but I, there was a video done by a helicopter flight, a 30 minute helicopter flight over that fire. It was really amazing. It was thir it, you know, it was basically that from Ashland all the way to Medford, and uh, it showed the how many of the homes and buildings had been burnt. And uh, it was, you know, it didn't. It isn't a ter terrain that looks like uh, Paradise, California, with trees everywhere. It's kind of a bare area, really. I mean, it's uh, to see that many homes was really shocking. Well, the Canyon Fire, which you just mentioned in Grant County, I know that Commissioner Palmer lost three homes in that fire. I remember it was just running down the canyon, and he actually almost lost his life. So um, he's been very concerned about what's happened all over our beautiful state. So that was a bad one. A couple of questions I had. Ed, from the, the information, I've been kind of following the, this numbers kind of like you're doing. One thing um, that I've learned over the last four years is that containment is a, I always think five or 10% containment doesn't sound like very, very good, except that means absolutely kind of contained. And there's quite a, usually that means there's another percentage that's kind of contained. So it's a better, I, for people that don't know how this information really uh, what it reflects, it's actually better, you know, if it's 10% contained, it may be 40% close to, con you know, there's, that's one thing. It, and I assume that's true in these fires as well. Correct, yes. Uh, so, um, you know, for several days last week, we were seeing 0% containment on most of these fires. We are tr starting to see those percentages rise. Uh, that That containment percent typically represents you know, the, the, the incident management team's estimation of fire line that is, uh, they feel extremely confident that that fire is not going to cross that fire line again. Uh, there's there's more than that as far as fire line that's built, uh, but there's still work to be done to secure that fire line and really feel uh, confident that, that that fire isn't gonna uh, cross over those lines. So I, I do expect, especially with uh, the rain, I was gonna, again mentioned uh, that uh, we are expecting rain to start on the west side tomorrow and a uh, more significant amount on Friday. Um, so uh, that will help out with the containment numbers as well as the resources that are continuing to increase on this fire and get those fire lines not just built but actually uh, plumbed with hose lays and, and mop up starting on, those, on each of those fires. And I actually want to commend the people that act um, completely contained the Green Ridge fire. That happened right before we had those horrific winds on September 7th when, um, well, I, actually the Lion's Head fire blew up on Saturday, September 5th, because I can see that fire from my house and it blew up completely Saturday, starting about noon, maybe even late morning. But the fact that the Green Ridge fire was actually out was totally a blessing because, you know, it would have just, it was just, you know, all there right together, and it would have made such a monster, um, you know, if they would have combined. So thank you to those people that worked on that fire. They really um, got that stopped at the right moment. Another question, Ed, I had was um, with uh, the, the amount of firefighters that you hear, I mean, some of the reports will say how many people are in each fire. Do you have any idea of how many personnel that are fighting fires, so to speak, are from are from Deschutes County, are in these various fires. Is, does somebody keep track of that kind of thing, or um, somebody does? Um, I I just have the gross numbers. I certainly don't have a breakdown of 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 crews or companies or personnel from uh, Deschutes County, but I would say that there are several companies based here in Deschutes County that I'm certain are contributing uh, 
a, f a fair amount of personnel to those fires, but I, I don't have any exact numbers on, on, on breakdowns. I would say that uh, the Lion's Head fire still continues to be the one with the most staff. Uh, they're reporting 1,113 people. Uh, some of the other fires have uh, anywhere between, looking at the report here, um, 783 on the Holiday Farm, and then it goes down from there. Riverside and Beachy Creek just have both over 500 uh, personnel on those fires. How many dozers are at Lion, Lion's Head now? Do you have that on your report? Uh, let's see. I do not have a report of dozers. No, nope, I've got cruise engines and helicopters. Okay. Well, are the helicopters flying today, though? I thought that the smoke was such a problem. It's It's been, that's been a challenge. Uh, with the smoke being this thick. Um, they've been taking uh, advantage where they can, but that's been relatively limited uh, up until this point. Oh gosh. Thank you very much for the updates. Good to uh, you know, kind of have that bigger picture, high level. If I could just close with just, just a couple other points of, of things that people can look for coming up from Deschutes County. Uh, one is that I just want to take this point to say that we are offering uh, community fuel reduction grants, um, you know, for, for preparedness and, and, and fire prevention standpoint. Those are still open through September 30th. So communities that uh, have a plan and want to do fuel reduction, we are offering that. Uh, and that's to prevent these types of things from happening in Deschutes County to our communities. So that's a that's an opportunity that's open. Um, well, uh, Ed, can they go to the website and pull up the application? Is that a, um, That is possible? available on our website. Okay, yeah. great. So I know I've, some people I've mentioned it too. So um, September 30th. And what is the amount, the maximum amount they can get for their grant? Uh, for each community, the maximum amount is forecast to be about $2,000. We've got a $20,000 uh, budget this year for those uh, grants. Okay. Great. Thank you for mentioning that. The other thing I was going to mention just again real briefly is that uh, as you'll recall uh, from several months back we did convene a wildfire mitigation advisory committee uh, that provided some recommendations on things that Deschutes County might consider in regards to wildfire mitigation and community development has been working with the University of Oregon to uh, come up with a community outreach plan which is uh, a little bit uh, challenging, obviously, during these times where we can't get together in you know, large groups of public meetings. But uh, I would encourage people to look for opportunities in the next month or two. Uh, we'll, we'll be uh, asking for the public's input on uh, what they think, um, uh, which of those recommendations we might potentially move forward with uh, or make sense for Deschutes County. So we are, we do take this issue uh, seriously and uh, have, a, have a few things coming up that people can potentially engage with the county on in regards with uh, the uh, fuel reduction grant that the uh, wildfire mitigation advisory committee recommendations as well as uh, the sheriff's office moving forward with uh, finalizing our long-term recovery plan that Haley Rich is, is, has been working on for a, a, a few months now. So uh, just a few things and highlights of, of things just to let people know that we are actively working on uh, on this issue in Deschutes County. Ed, what are, do we have fire free this fall? Do we have those dates? I do not have the dates yet, but we are planning fire free for the fall. Uh, that will likely be, uh, and it is typically the uh, very end of October and into the first week of November. So look for those dates here shortly. Uh, as we finalize those with Republic Services, and we will be getting a news release out, I expect, right here at the end of September. But I would suggest anyone that has a lot of, of brush at their property now should take it to the transfer station because you really don't want to have it sitting there till the end of October. Just keep sure. your properties really clean, take a fresh look at um, your defensible space. It's really important if you have any dead bushes around your house, you should take them out now. So you um, you know, you don't have to have them over the winter and um, start fresh next year, next spring. And I would say, yeah, just uh, take a moment. Uh, needles on the inside, uh, 
corner of a roof in the gutter, uh, on the ground, up on, under the eaves. I mean, you could take a, a garbage bag of needles from an optimal location tonight and possibly uh, you know, limit the opportunity of that fire starting just from a spark uh, coming down from the sky. So a little bit at a time, all the time. Yes, constant. Yeah. Yeah, you really just have to be very aware. So thank you, Ed. Um, I get one more question. Ed, uh, the Fire Mitigation Committee, that's the one we started with about a year ago, looking at the maps and then looking at the issue of uh, building rules. And so we're going to do some more things with that, is what you're saying? Uh, that's correct, Commissioner. Uh, the Community Development Department is really taking the, the lead on that. But they, they did receive uh, some some funding to engage with the uh, University of Oregon to come out up with just uh, getting more input from the public on uh, looking at those recommendations and uh, seeing if there's support in the community uh, for those or thoughts around um, which one of the if any of those recommendations uh, are are supported by the public and, and getting their input through a series of either online events or, or surveys. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ed, Thanks for, you. Um, you know, I know I read, I think I counted like 15, 14 fires in Oregon. And yes, it's really, um, you've covered 95% of them. So thank you. Thank you again for the work this morning. Um, I believe now Dr. Conway wants to talk about um, health services and smoke and mask and how to stay healthy um, at this time. Thank you so much. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, commissioners. I'll try to keep this brief uh, given the time. So um, I will, I will share my screen in a moment here. Uh, there's actually I'll go ahead and share it now. Can you see some slides now? Yes, a slide. Can. Great. So actually, I just want to start out with a, a, a point I didn't want to interrupt uh, uh, Nahad's presentation. So the, the um, <clears throat> school reopening thresholds are written as less than or equal to 10 cases per 100,000. And the 2002 U.S. Census, uh, I'm sorry, the 2020 U.S. Census intercensal estimate for the two counties population is 202,000. Uh, so um, we actually, as far as I know, we actually are under the line. So 20 so, means we're under that number. Yes, uh, for both of those weeks that are yep. 20, the right. week and the two, two weeks prior. So we're, uh, we're, we're, just, <laughs> we're just skating by, by those criteria. Um, and, I, and OHA does publish once a week, uh, late in the week, a, a concatenation of all those statistics along with their overall testing rate, et cetera, so that I'm sure that the uh, school districts are very attentive to that, as is ODE. Um, so to talk about smoke, and this is, this is a very brief, don't worry, it's not 30 slides or something like that. I think I have six or seven slides. Um, just want to talk a little bit about smoke and health since we've had many questions about that. Air quality is the sort of generic term for that. And uh, we have, I'll, I'll mention this website twice, uh, three W's, deschutes.org forward slash smoke. Uh, and there's air quality links, and there's also quite a few tips. So I'll go through some of those. And uh, this is uh, a, a, a site uh, grabbed from uh, earlier today. And uh, this, this puts, uh, uh, virtually everywhere other than Lapine as uh, being in the hazardous or worse zone for air. Um, so the main thing that we worry about for, for smoke, we worry about ash, which of course you may see on your car or your house or your windows. Uh, we worry about uh, visible smoke and the irritating effects. But the big health concern is what we call PM 2.5. And that's just the size that's uh, uh, 2.5 microns in diameter. And just for a sense of scale, this is human hair. Um, this is the finest beach sand. Uh, this is the 
uh, size of particles such as dust, pollen, and mold. So the challenge with this is 2.5 is so small that many of the historically even high-end air filters don't capture that very well. Um, the problem with two, uh, PM 2.5 is it's so small, it can go down into the airways, it can cause inflammation of the smaller tubes, the bronchioles, which can precipitate an asthma attack in someone that's been, uh, that's had asthma previously. It can cause some damage to the lung, carries a cancer risk and a risk of heart attack. And the mechanism for these latter things is that it's so small, it gets down through the tubes in the lungs and into the air sacs, what we call a VLA. And it's so small that it can be actively transported through those air sacs into the bloodstream. So once it's in the bloodstream, the biggest, the biggest problem is carbon, the same way that carbon causes havoc and many other things that we know of, but is essential to human life. Carbon, when it gets in elemental form, black carbon, uh, gets into the bloodstream, it can be very uh, inflammatory and cause havoc and things like blood, blood cells. And the uh, lining of, uh, of the vessel. So um, one of the things we've had a lot of questions about is masks. The masks that we've been recommending, and this has been to, to preserve N95 masks for the people that need them for primarily for healthcare during COVID. We've been recommending to use this simple cloth mask, and we've talked a lot about this before. It should be dense enough that you don't see through it, but can easily breathe through it. The point of these is to trap respiratory droplets when you cough, sneeze, talk, or yell, so that you don't spray someone else with that, which might have virus. Um, and But it does not protect you from uh, particulate matter and wildlife smoke. It's much too coarse, the filter. An N95 mask, on the other hand, N95 refers to, uh, the N is for non-petroleum, so non-oily. 95 refers to 95% of the uh, particles of 2.5 uh, microns are captured per pass of air through that. So this is good protection. So it protects 95% exclusion if it's properly fitted. And uh, the only uh, cautionary thing for this is these are not for young children and not for frail adults. The best thing is if it's in a work environment that you're already fit tested, but if not, I'll show you something else in a moment. And anyone that has any concerns about this really should talk to their healthcare provider first before donning a mask. Our main advice is to stay inside. Um, so the right respirator, in this case would be an N95, it needs to fit reasonably well. And if you go on our site, if somebody's interested in this thing, go on our site and we'll see some directions and guidance for that. The important things for protecting your health that apply for everyone is it's very important when the air quality is bad. So that would be uh, orange for people with the, on the colorimetric scale. Uh, green is fine for everybody. Yellow means you might want to consider curtailing activity, especially if you have any uh, acute illness or any underlying health problems. Orange, caution, red, once you get to red and above purple maroon, basically everyone should just stay inside. If you must go outside and you're otherwise healthy, then, then wearing a mask like an N95 mask like we just discussed would be an option. Uh, you should stay in, indoors. If you have one, a HEPA, a high efficiency particulate air filter uh, can help a lot. Uh, you can make a very cheap substitute for this by taking a box fan, square box fan, and putting a MERV, it's just a, a efficiency rating, 13 or better air filter. These are available for rent $20 at home improvement stores. And you can just put it on the intake side to cover the box fan. And that actually is remarkably effective in filtering the air. You just leave it on, uh, but not while well, you're not around because it could, it could uh, overheat the fan. Stay hydrated is very important. Uh, one of the concerns we have with smoke is that because we have COVID afoot as well, we don't want people uh, drying out or irritating their mucous membranes because it might make you more susceptible to COVID as well. You should not add to the particulate in your house by vacuuming. Oh, that's, we need to mention that. 
That's very important not to vacuum. Right. I'll be right. sure. Vacuuming I'll be sure really and tell bad. my husband that I'm not supposed <laughs> to. Right, vacuum. We can't vacuum for a while. Vacu um, it really mobilizes. It really I've objected to it for years. <laughs> <laughs> the particles. So, so have I. Um, it's Dr. also a very Conway, handy excuse for chore avoidance, but I won't mention that. Uh, um, I have a question. Um, I've yes, seen yes, where they say use half a box of baking soda in a crock pot set on high to help with your house. Um, and I actually saw it on a doctor's post yesterday. I was wondering, did you have any opinion on that? I don't have any opinion on that. I know that baking soda, uh, calcium bicarbonate is useful for odor mitigation. I don't know if it has any efficacy uh, in this, in this um, problem. Um, we do know, though, that you don't want to add to the air pollution. So if you have a gas stove, too, you want to use that sparingly. You don't want to be burning candles. They mobilize a lot of hydrocarbons, a lot of PM2.5. And frying and broiling food both mobilize a lot of that, too. If you start feeling difficulty breathing or if you have questions, talking to your healthcare provider, your doctor would be good. And then we have a lot of tips at uh, 3wsdeschutes.org forward smoke, including how to make one of those uh, box fan filters and uh, some more detailed uh, background information on how to mitigate and manage smoke in your area. And I do want to point out that this, that we're talking about smoke and it's very important to avoid that hazard, but it, we don't want to imply any lack of sensitivity to that the biggest hazard from wildfires is being in wildfires, losing your home, or your life, your animals, and whatnot. So we're not trivializing that, but this is a very broad exposure for the population. So we're just trying to encourage people to stay safe in this way. And unless there are other questions about that, I will do my best to stop sharing. I noticed that the sisters, um, I was pulling up the highest numbers. Sisters was at 628, I believe it was on Friday. Um, ben, the highest they've been at is 525. Uh, Prineville was at 400, their highest, and today it looks like Bend, hopefully it looks like it's going down right at the moment, but um, it was at 264, so it's sure, still, sure. it's there still are at a dangerous that, level. There are things that help, uh, hopefully if it rains, that helps scour the air. Uh, you may have noticed that during the middle of the day, even if there's persistent smoke, there's often a dip in the AQI, and that's because, especially if there's no wind, um, as the air heats up, you get what we call thermal uh, thermal mixing. So there's some convection that reduces it. So typically at the night, the nights that have still air, when you still have fire inputs, uh, smoke are, is going to be the worst. But this has been very bad. I, I you know I've lived in very air polluted areas such as China, and even in China, the experience in Central Oregon and, and especially in Western Oregon. Uh, uh, Willamette Valley, et cetera, has been uh, really would have been something that would give the uh, Chinese a great deal of caution as well. So it, it really is, there's nothing um, weak about uh, basically staying inside and, and hiding from yeah. events, the bad air. So one thing that interests me is, so where do we get the N95 masks that everybody should be wearing outside? Do we have, because I'm never, I'm not clear if we have a stockpile. But yeah, actually, Nate, Nathan, uh, I think, was going to mention that we do have we do have a limited inventory that we freed up uh, for requests for this purpose. I do want to reiterate, we really are still trying to preserve N95 masks. So, um, if someone really needs one to do chores outside or to work outside, uh, that's a perfectly reasonable request. There, are the industrial style ones are available, and some of the some of the um, uh, home improvement stores already, but we do have an inventory of particularly the KN95 masks, which um, they there's an issue with the ear loops fitting to provide ideal uh, healthcare worker protection. But I think that those are a, a, a good sort of intermediate measure, and I understand that Sergeant Garibay has has set aside some of those. I think the KN95s are the ones that were distributed to all the chambers of commerce, and a lot of businesses have had yes, access yes. to those. So you're yes, saying actually, that, K, so what's the K stand for for the N? Yeah, yeah. And actually, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> kind okay. of N95. <laughs> so if you have any of the, if you have one of those KN95s, those are 
those are reasonably functional, the ones that we distributed. The thing was that because they didn't, they caused kind of a pucker by the ears, they weren't sufficient. The, the well, NIOSH provided emergency use uh, for KN95 because the filtration standard, the KN is just the Chinese equivalent of the uh, American N95. The filta filtration um, membrane in those is effective, mm -hmm. but um, they, they cause a slight pucker, which uh, NIOSH decided, NIOSH is the part of the CDC that regulates uh, respirators, decided that there wasn't good enough fit. But as far as filtration goes, they're good. And certainly to, for brief episode, I mean, to work out in the smoke. And then checking, there, you'll see instructions, uh, links for checking to see how it fits. And you could maybe adapt or adjust it a little bit so you get a bit better fit. So that would be a, a reasonable compromise for short-term use in the smoke. So for the public then, I mean, getting beyond the county having some some supply, uh, the public can get these at stores is what you think they're available yes. now in a lot of the hardware stores or the home. Yes, but I do want to emphasize the most important guidance during these episodes of very bad air is to stay indoors. So only people that have chores that must be done, you know, if you have to, if you have to, what are the horses? If you're in the middle of haying, what, whatever, uh, then that's an appropriate use. But um, getting one just for contingent use, especially if it's one of the medical grade ones, um, I'm, I'm thinking during COVID that that really you really need to have a, a, a purpose for this use. I think the KN95s though, that we have the inventory of her, it's a very appropriate uh, way to meet that need. And I, I, and if somebody has trouble finding one readily, uh, then they can get in touch with. Surgeon Garibay and the EOC were feeling that again, that's through the health department. So if the, the particle number is under, what is it, 171? Is that where we're better off? It's going to be okay not to wear a mask? What is the level? I know I read a letter from OSHA last week, I believe, and I thought if they sa said it was over like 170, you shouldn't be outside. Um, I'm trying to get the uh, the scale up for for that. And I'll reshare. I'll reshare the screen. As I got on this. Um, this one doesn't have the numbers. Let me get the smoke. What did you think it was? It goes from 170 to up to um, 600. Yeah, Sisters I think was the highest in the state last Friday, and uh, the highest max in Sisters was 628. Whereas um, Ben's highest was 525, Prineville's highest was 400, and I think Madras has been pretty low too, relatively. I'm uh, trying to get the. Um, you're saying there's a number that below right. which you're. Right. OSHA sent out a, lo a letter last week and said if you are over, I know it was like 170, I thought, and please, you shouldn't be working outside. Yeah, I don't remember. There is a, there's an AQI there's an AQI guide on our website, and the the green is under 50. The yellow, I believe, is 50 to 100. The orange is 100 to 150. And above above 150, I believe, is when everyone should be cautious. And between 100 and 150 AQI. Okay. Um, so when, it's like 150. The, the scale for that is available on all of these sites. I just don't want to take up your time. Okay. But, Okay, well, I'll, I'll look it up. And I think the thing that's amazing, I think in 31 years, I can only remember in 2017, people not working because of smoke. I, and I can't remember any other times when this was, you know, was brought up. Oh, you shouldn't be outside. And I know, oh, you know people are, people are, yeah, during that it was really, I think was the last, only other time I've seen this kind of smoke where you got quarter mile visibility and uh, at least locally, so. We did, Commissioner, we did monitoring during the milling fire for the sister school district because uh, Kurt Scholl had asked us to do it and uh, we did agree that it'd be prudent to delay uh, opening the high school, which yeah, I remember that. put air handling and air filtration by a week and sisters did go over 500 a number of times and I think that was the year that they canceled sisters folk as well because yeah. of the very bad air quality so so this does occur here but this is this is extraordinary and certainly the level 
of the problem throughout the Western states, the West Coast, uh, Oregon, California, and Washington to have so much influence and have such a bad air. And yeah, what I was saying though is in 31 years, I think it, it very seldom occurs here. I mean, this is the, the million in 17 was another time, but uh, this has really been extraordinary, these two, two summers like this. Yes, I, I agree. We're hoping that this is not the new normal. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Conway. Thank you for your slides. Thanks very much. I appreciate your, uh, you. your um, information this morning. Actually, this afternoon now. Thank you. All right. Thanks, so we do have um, other items. Do we want to do lunch recess? And okay. So what time should we come back then? I have a 1.30 for the veterans. I need to, I'm going to have to step out for that. So if we come back, what at 1.15? I can be here for 15 minutes. Uh, so you're going to be done for the rest of the day? Well, no, I have, there's a, it's a Zoom for the veterans funding that, of course, it's today at 1.30. So I have that, and then I have, I have a meeting with Annette and the, a group later after that. Well, don't we have, I mean, I have several other items, but I also, uh, don't we also have uh, a, um, Executive, executive session. session. Yes. Right. I know. Um, and we'll just take a break for ten or fifteen minutes. I wanted to get. Yeah, I wanted to get a. Okay, fifteen minute break then. How about twenty? Twenty minutes. Yeah, I'd like to. Yes, there you okay, go. twenty minutes, and then we'll be back into session. So, let's. Um, we'll reconvene then at at twelve forty five, and then I'll have forty five minutes. That'll be great. Okay, excellent. We're going to reconvene our afternoon meeting, September 16, 2020, um, and we have um, other items to bring up. So I had a couple. Okay. Um, one, I was wondering, you know, with the, the fires and the, the fact that we're not the affected county, what about us making us some kind of contribution to the Red Cross from a county, one of our sources of funding, as some way to help out? Because we're not able to do much other things. I just thought I'd bring that up as another item. Because um, they're apparently having to house all the people they're housing. Any thoughts on that? Definitely would be nice. Um, what kind of funding could we um, attack at this moment? What's available for us, Tom? Uh, well, uh, commissioners, you have a couple different sources of con uh, um, discretionary funding uh, that you could use for a whole range of things for the benefit of you know, the community, uh, either general fund or um, unallocated TRT. That's what I was thinking, unallocated TRT. I like that. I mean, I'm not thinking of a, I was thinking of a small amount, like maybe $5,000 or Which something. Small? But well, Five. I was thinking 5000 that was my initial thought, something like that. But want to understand how how services are flowing um, my wife is involved with the Ford Foundation was on a phone call recently and there was a, a mayor from weed California mentioned that there was um, you know um, benefits available for people but it took a long time for some things to get in their hands where it was awkward so my point is I wonder if is Red Cross really just paying out right for all the rooms but for or, how long and yes I mean well, they, when I met with them they said they were gonna that was the best thing they needed the most that, like they really weren't looking for their people weren't that are staying in motels can't really take many material things because they're staying and I'm referring to just is are people paying for rooms and getting reimbursed or is Red Cross paying for them? I think Red, I, there's, it was actually somebody there paying for the rooms from Red yeah. Cross. So they making sure it goes right to that is all I was trying to get to. Right. And yeah. we could research how to make it. we give it to the wrong middleman, not middleman, but you know, the wrong agent. No, I agree. It take a long time to get to where we intended. That's what I was thinking. Another would be the Sheriff's Department. You know, they're doing, you can give them money and they're buying. They're buying cards and I really like that the best. Honestly, they that can give them gas cards. Us, they can yeah. give them cards for Safeway, for food. The power of fund like that. Yeah. That's kind of on the ground. Uh, Nathan knows, uh, uh, you know, uh, Haley. Haley's doing yep. it. And I, yep. because she 
you know, she's down here from OMAC where they had it so horrifically, what, 14? That may be the place to. I, I think really that would maybe be a safer place. You know, just people well, I don't need that. I'd be interested in the housing costs, but I don't know how. I'm, I'm with you. I'd want to make sure it gets to pay for the. I mean, maybe we just literally go out in there and pay for X number of rooms. Yeah, maybe for, something like I that. I mean, we're doing it for the other ways we're doing housing Reducing like that. Reducing the overhead, too, yeah. of, of who's making the decision. I wonder if. Do we have anybody that could ask how that's being paid for? And. Well, I'd, ma I'd, I'd move to do something to the sheriff's office now then, like, you know. Another 5000 $5,000 to those type things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we can research if there's anything for ho towards housing that we could do. Okay. Is there what, staying at the same was, rate and my place, and then the church is also, the Presbyterian church? There's over 200 people, yeah, that they're supposedly, that's a lot of money per day. Somebody in um, Sisters has given their um, three-bedroom condo, and three couples are living in it right now. I'm on my, yeah. So. Commissioners, I'm, I, we're happy to uh, work with Nathan on that. He's been kind of our point person. Uh, I understand that one of the issues wasn't so much paying for the rooms, but was availability of rooms mm -hmm. uh, that, that they were able to work with. So um, I worked with Nathan towards the end of last week through COVA, to try to do a, a reach out communication to the lodging partners in the rural county and uh, um, Nathan had reached out directly to Kevney for uh, Visit Bend, you know, for trying to line up lodging providers that are willing to provide a block rooms for, um, you know, uh, evacuees. And mm -hmm. evidently the Red Cross was trying to, and this was reported a little bit in the media, keep people together as much as they can from the same community for purpose of, you know, mutual support and those sorts of things so well yeah it's super eight i mean you go there and it's i mean i get some pictures you know it's just that's who was there it was the groups of these of people from these communities yeah right so uh we're continuing to do that but we're happy to um talk to nathan directly and see where uh we can help you know either with a you know either a direct purchase or a contribution to mm -hmm. you know, might do the most direct and immediate good i Honestly, I would hope we could do like five thousand for their lodging and five thousand for cards for food, gas, uh, essentials because it, they've lost everything. Okay. I'm good with that. Uh, I agree. I support that. And we can start with that and then find out, um, you know, what <clears throat> what can we do to help? And if you know, how long are they going to be here? And I know housing is in such demand. Well, that could be a pretty positive message about transient room tax being reinvested in people's time of need. Right. Yeah, I think that's really good. So the second item I had was um, there was an email, I think I forwarded it to people, about that the health department had, had given advice to Richard Coe or someone that were, they're, they're suggesting we don't support Halloween this year. And I'm like, before the health department does that, I think we should have a bigger discussion about what is the, is there a county position on Halloween? And because I, I I just think it's kind of it's a big deal. Halloween is, and it's a big deal publicly. The people are, are talking about it in other communities, but I don't think it should just come out of a health department. Um, so. I just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, our... no, and, and the, that was in the media update last night. Um, and, right. And honestly, we probably could have been a little more descriptive in how we worded that. Um, the editorial actually came out in today's paper. I don't know if you've seen that, but it no, was. I haven't. The, the quote attributed to Dr. Conway in the article is that, you know, we haven't developed any any uh, formal guidelines or, or directives, neither the state nor we had locally I mean, it was kind of, in general, you know, a word of caution in terms of traditional type trick-or-treating. But he did say in there that there may be other ways to do trick-or-treating, and that's really what it was centered on. It wasn't the holiday in general. It was just on trick-or-treating. I don't know. The point is that we ought to be in the loop. I, yeah, no that's what my That's what my point is. I don't know if the other commissioners agree, but I just, this isn't just, you know, the advice is supposed to, we're the health authority, and I just think we should be in the loop on this stuff, and especially on big events like this that, you know, stores are stocked with Halloween stuff. So are we going to cancel it in Deschutes County this year? I mean, it's, 
we ought to be talking about it here before it's talked about in the paper is what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I, I don't say that about everything. I mean, he's in the paper a lot about all his thoughts, but even, you know, I'm just saying there's some things I think that are public issues that we ought to be in the loop on. I hear you. And if I hadn't brought it up, we wouldn't be. So, uh, alert health to, you know, perhaps is <clears throat> next week's COVID update. We can have a conversation there or individually or however you you would like. But as a starting point, we'll we'll plan on next week. Well, and I mean, uh, this is a community event holiday social thing. Uh, you know, I do support if our health director has guidance or thoughts about what's prudent, but I don't think of ourselves as Deschutes County giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down to a, an event like that. I mean, that's just society. That's community. That's We're part of it. We're not driving a holiday. Well, but I just think, some you know, communities in the country are. Well, I, so I would I would advocate yeah, for us staying away from it. Brought yeah. up at this level, mm -hmm. what do we? What is our role with things like this here in Deschutes? Yeah, so that's how I would approach it. You know, the fact that we're not driving it. It's, you know, the retail pressure on these uh, things is amazing, so, which is what you referred to. You uh, well, I'm not pressured by the retail. I'm just saying it's a big. No, thing I, that yeah. The public thinks it's a big thing. Families. Retail think it's thinks a it's a big thing. thing. It is a lot. It of is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I yeah, we could talk about it, but yeah, I, I don't think we, there's a, not a leadership opportunity there, I don't think. Other than well, we're guidance. having but we're having a leadership by talking about it now you're saying. By well, somebody in our that works for the county is having a leadership position on this without and I just think we that's yeah. So your feeling is we shouldn't take any position. I actually asked my husband, the doctor, this morning about it. <laughs> he is a doctor. He was a doctor. And um, he said, well, that might be a good idea. And he's usually been pretty proactive. Uh, you know, maybe he'd say a different thing when I ask him tomorrow. You know, <laughs> um, you know, people going door to door, I don't know. Oh, yeah. I mean. Three feet to get the candy. And there's a discussion there for yes. sure. Well, I just love that one of the markets here in town, you can actually take your used bags in and they will touch them and fill them for you. Now you go to another market and you can't bring your bag in the door. Oh, I know. So, you know, I there's such a cross section of That happened of to me, COVID. I had my bag under my arm and I was walking yeah. in and they're treating me like a criminal. I'm like, yes. what am I supposed to do here? You're trying another to recycle. Those guys. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, he's got his bag. This is really bad. Was, well, yeah, it's funny. But there are markets you can go to with your yeah, bag. Oh, and, and they're they excited to take them. Yeah, out. and they're like, hey, you know what? It doesn't really stick there, so. Yeah, I know. It's It's been fascinating. Um, are the, is there anything else? I just want to bring it up that we should have a discussion about it. Okay. And then, can I bring up something really quickly? Um, um, a couple of months ago, as you noticed, uh, Katie Condit had uh, moved, I believe, to Tacoma. She was on the COIC board, and per the bylaws that they had from 1971, the board uh, was appointments by um, three appointments were from Deschutes County, and one is a representative of timber and wood products, one is, um, and she represented the unemployed and underemployed for Deschutes County. They were appointed by their respective county commissioner. So the question is, COIC is in the process of changing their bylaws, and but because the bylaws have not been changed yet, I think we should go ahead and fill this position. I agree. Because I agree. It's, it's been, I, I'm sorry, I apologize, I didn't bring it up sooner. All of a sudden I went, oh my gosh, yeah, Katie, Katie hasn't been there for well, a couple of meetings, our Zoom meetings. So, so that would be okay? Mm hmm Okay, good. All right, so we There's will. Somebody to fill a slot, mm -hmm. basically. Yes. It's, there's um, five appointed members by one from each crook in Jefferson and three from Deschutes County. So, all right, so we'll, we'll get that done. Next week. Well, I think because I see them involved in so many things, I'd like when you get a suggested bylaws change, maybe you could bring that to our attention yes. too. Because, you know, I noticed they run the the now they're running the Deschutes Basin Water Collaborative. They run the they facilitate the Deschutes Forest Collaborative. They do housing for all group. I mean, they go all these groups that they are in charge of and they they've decided who should be members from what i can see on some of it and it's like 
I'd like to know what to make sure we keep them involved. Well, this is our Central Oregon Council of Governments, a 190. Uh, if there's bylaws changes, we would be signing as the governing body, uh, as, as one of the participants of a governing body. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I definitely want to review that also. Right. I, I'll ask Dave. Dave has them. Dave, if you could, he's, is he part of the call right now? Please, Dave, if you could send that to the other commissioners, that would be excellent because I gave them feedback from Dave's review prior to our last meeting, but then they were going to let everyone uh, think about it before we voted next month. So what would be helpful is if we would see the before and after, so to speak, because I don't know what the bylaws say now. Right. So we might see how they're and I've been to change it. There was a proposed bylaw change. Remember, I don't, uh, a couple years ago, there was the 1971 or 73 original coordination uh, of the, the creation of the whole organization. And then there was a like an operating management agreement which was in place. And that was put in place because of some other, other federal guidelines. So they had more of a board. And then we determined that, hey, that's not the driving principles. It was the original agreement. So now we're back to the original agreement again. Um, which is set up as our council of governments, including the cities. So I'd be very interested to see what the proposed changes are now. Okay, great. Speaking of that, so on the Deschutes River, Deschutes Basin Water Collaborative, there's bylaws to approve and um, membership in it. And I thought we already were members, but they, for some reason, there must be something official we're supposed to do, but do you want to see what those bylaws are if, if I bring them to the next meeting? Right. Okay. We should get them before. Yeah, let's get, yeah, so let's get those. I'll see if I can get them in the next couple of days so we can talk about them on Monday so I can give good feedback. I was, was kind of surprised that I, I've been at several meetings. I thought they knew we wanted to be a member, but, but the bylaws also. Okay. Okay, great. All right, Commissioner Devon. Uh, so... Investment advisory committee meeting. Did did you offer to do that? Did we? Start yeah. That? Yeah. I was going to do it. You, okay. So yep. there's a meeting next Thursday. It's on my calendar. And yeah. That should be you. I don't, did you get that? I got a notice about it. Yeah. So it's next Thursday. Yeah. So I'm I'll just making sure it's not on my schedule. So I'll take it off. Greg Munn coordinates that. Um, uh, Samantha, I think, is helping coordinate that also. So if you talk to Samantha, she can make sure. Okay. Have that. So that's next Thursday news um and i had already written down a legislative idea about urban renewal changes you know so this could go to the legislature it was good to yeah. be able to ask that lady elaine howard uh the big picture here um you know i just don't have a feel for it if it's if you know once again if deschutes county it just happens to be active with this or or does everywhere every city looking at doing this around the state these days or you know I, i'm not sure how to calibrate these big urban renewal asks that have come through and what we saw in bend and coming down the pike from redmond they're being polite and telling us what they're doing and we say thanks for telling us and then that's all it is so it's kind of an awkward situation and just like the sheriff brought in originally you know the voters aren't really be informed and re informed about what's going on here yeah uh, you know that your tax dollars there's a percentage being swept for the next 20 or 30 years and oh, it's uh, been 30 yeah but nobody even sees it and we just think magic happens well, here. and, and magic money shows up for these renewal districts and it's not i think it's great you're thinking about it because uh i was surprised to learn about this situation with the education districts mm -hmm. the school boards and the, yeah so it's but they don't make deal. a statement because they aren't losing 70 you know yeah. 70 million dollars less it looks like goes into the education system but because it's on a statewide formula, they actually just get back $5 million. So rather than, they, they literally, what I learned when I was doing my interviews with, with the chamber, the only two entities that commented, I think, were us and maybe Parks and Rec or something. But so people asked me, well, you know, why is the county even getting involved in that? Yeah, they don't know. That, that's what they literally either. asked me yeah. and criticized me. I'm like, well, wait, we were asked to get involved. I was surprised that others weren't getting involved. Yeah. But it's it's a massive amount of money, and and I think it's great that you're talking about it. I, well, uh, so the idea is to put it on a list of legislative ideas. Maybe mm -hmm. talk to you know, and I can talk to you know, senator or whoever you know, get something going here. Um, 
But just to understand the big picture of the history in the state of Oregon, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is it a contentious item or are we just happen to be in the, uh, you know, active time in Deschutes County now or you I don't know. You can talk to Senator Lithicum. You can talk to Senator Canope and I can talk to Senator Here Finley. we go. So, yeah, we, we've got him covered. Yeah. That's great. So this is good. We'll have to so if, yeah, carry on. Um, if Whitney just put that on a legislative, to you know, just a okay. reminder list, that's all. Do you have anything else? Uh, that's all I brought today. Okay. So, well, I, I have one I, other. I went to a half a dozen else? meetings in the last few days, but. Okay. I have one other. Yes. So I saw last night a uh, email from Tom about the ethics and compliance hotline, and I was just kind of, I think I shared, I wanted to bring it up here that really this was, uh, this is written in, in your name, Tom, that you take the violations, but there's nothing about the commissioners taking violations seriously. And I was just thinking we should somehow come up with a something saying this was a board passed policy to institute this. This isn't a uh, county government only policy. This is something we looked at as a public policy. So I think it's great that you'd, you'd like to do that. And I apologize for not doing it the first time around. Um, I was planning on uh, kind of featuring it a little bit in the Friday update that's supposed to come out this week, so I'd be delighted to put in some quotes or some whatever language you'd like to see in, in terms of your value in it, your emphasis on it, and uh, we can follow up with you and see if there's some. But, yeah, I think I'd, I'd be happy if you do it in the update, but I really think there should be an e email that goes out to everybody pointing this out, because this is a, in, a direct email to every county employee you know, basically says, I take ethical evaluations as well as perception very seriously. And it mentions Dave Givens' involvement, which is good, and HR and county legal doesn't ever mention the board of directors. So um, it seems like we maybe should do an email and I'd just, you know, maybe come up with some. Just wanted to clarify this is. Well, I'd be comfortable with just the uh, just, but I'd, I'd be com comfortable with the update. The, the county update. Um, I, you know, we do take this seriously, and uh, uh, you know, this is a new policy. Uh, it took a while <clears throat> to get to this point. I was kind of lukewarm on this because it, it just provides another outside feedback loop, which is not bad. But my point is, if you know, hopefully we have the internal loops and communication open enough where anything could be acknowledged without having to go out to this loop. So as I say, the loop's not well, bad. Right. That's a good point. It's really an additional means. Yeah. It's not a new policy in a way is what you're saying. Well, I mean, it's it's a new system that's outside, you know, another whole loop. But as I say, so I, you know, I would hope that we have a culture and a relationships that, uh, you know, we don't need to get out, out to there. But it's about it's out there and it should be used if needed. So... I'd be very comfortable with just the weekly update or the county update. So okay. I, I guess that kind of puts you in a spot where do you want to see another email? Because he's requesting specifically for an email to be followed up, and I'm saying the county update would be appropriate. It's pretty important. An email yeah, is so. fine. Uh, I'm sorry, email? Yeah, yeah. sure, why not? Um, This. Well, I mean, you could do it from the chair then, as the chair, or, or you know, from all three of us too, if you want to do something simple like that. So right. can I? It, so it, it augments Tom's email. Yes. Okay. Well, if you want to come up a draft, I'll look at it. If you all right. want my two bits. Okay. So I've got another update or two, just stuff yes. I did in the last two days. So. Uh, Monday was Association of Oregon Counties. I was able to join in uh, natural resources, transportation, and community development, uh, a, a legislative committee meeting, and a board meeting. Uh, so that was quite a day of Zoom meetings. Um, basically, everybody that was involved at the AOC level were not the fire counties as much. You know, I mean, that's who attended. It was interesting to see what was going on. So we we you know, kind of acknowledged the fire events and the smoke in the state, but really just talked about each of the different events. Nothing really bubbled up 
as legislative ideas, but that's what we're setting up for in this next month. Uh, this is September, so October, what does AOC want to start to you know, advocate for, sign on to, or mature to setting up for the legislative session next year? So that was kind of the big picture, what was going on. Um, um, my calendar all took the passwords instead of as the t instead of the telephone numbers mm. on my phone system. Yeah. Everything worked great for me in the Yeah, computer. nothing worked great for me. Every oh. one of them was wrong. <laughs> I had to like go to my original documentation. I couldn't believe at least we figured out what it, what number. Yeah, somehow it got set up that way. Yeah, it's tricky. I was able to dial in uh, zoom into the fair association meeting just in support of uh, the fair association, remember, not the board or or uh, us or uh, you know, Jeff was there in attendance. The association was talking about, uh, you know, this next proposed kind of agreement that would something we're going to put in on paper or whatever in the near right. future. We um, updated agreement. So I was able to, you know, just uh, kind of say hi. I said a few words, but it was really their meeting I attended. So um, they did put a f like a four or five person committee together to, uh, you know, kind of lay it out, figure out what they're looking for. One of the statements was that the agreement that was proposed 20 years ago or whatever it was is probably the boilerplate for what they want to do now. So that was just a starting point is what I picked up from that meeting. And then uh, 911 user board meeting. There was, a, there was a radio tower, I think it was in Lynn County that was lost, or a communication tower uh, from the fires. So uh, they were able to rewire and uh, connect in some radios on a, a site that we're involved in to at least get them the backside of their county some radio coverage. So there was a, some loss in public safety infrastructure. I don't know the specifics, but it was just mentioned. Um, the Bend Metropolitan Plan Planning Organization also yesterday at noon. So that's the city of Bend, ODOT, and Deschutes County. Chris Doty was there with me also. Um, Nothing major there, just uh, there was some different agenda items. Uh, there's a big update about the transportation uh, safety action plans. So the city of Bend and Deschutes County both did those, and that's all crash data. Uh, you know, either uh, injuries or deaths when it's a bad crash or minor crashes, and how the system could be engineered better, you know, fixing intersections or lanes for turning, or is it how much of it is driver behavior? or, uh, you know, intoxication or texting and driving. You know, so there, there's these published documents right now for Bend and the Deschutes County proper for transportation safety plans. That's the stuff I did the last few days. Okay. Yes, and I did have my sister's ECHO meeting yesterday, and sister's is uh, booming. Um, Black Butte is really booming and um, I, um, the other side of the story is I think the average home sales were like almost 900,000 in sisters last month. So yeah. it's amazing. People are, you know, and then of course we'll have, we'll create more unaffordable housing. So yes, the good and the bad. There was a mention of a transportation system development fee in uh, Lapine recently now. So that was an email that we just saw. So Transportation SDC put in place uh, with, yeah. Are we going to have that? Kind of after, <laughs> on, our just, on our agenda. Yeah, I saw that email too yeah. on our agenda maybe next week or. Yes. Sure. It's really important. So is there anything? Which is just interesting news, yeah. Anything else? Because we do need to go to the. Oh, yeah, no, let's move on. Yeah. Okay, so now can you take everyone off because we need to go to our executive, please? <laughs> 